Hello. Welcome to Converging Dialogues. This is Xavier Bonilla. On this episode, I am really excited to be talking with Richard Polt. Richard is a professor in the philosophy department at Xavier University. He's also the associate dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. He has a bachelor's in philosophy from the University of California at Berkeley and a PhD from the Committee on Social Thought at the University of Chicago. His main interests are in Greek and German philosophy. He's obviously taught many courses in both of those areas. He's also um, the author of a handful of books uh, on Heidegger, um, more recently, Time and Trauma, Thinking Through Heidegger in the 30s. He's translated Heidegger, um, most notably Introduction to Metaphysics. He translated from the German. And he is an absolute expert on Heidegger. Now, I've had many conversations on the podcast with different folks about Heidegger and sort of in a kind of an overview, and some have been a little bit of a deeper dive, but I've been wanting to talk to uh, an expert on Heidegger's philosophy for a while, and I was very, very happy and excited to talk with Richard about uh, Heidegger and everything about his philosophy and a little bit about him. The one point of emphasis here is... Uh, since I've talked about Heidegger before, I wanted to go and do a deep dive into some of the concepts that um, are talked about a lot, but not so in depth, and other concepts that get that don't get talked about enough. And I was pleasantly surprised at how conversational uh, Richard is. You know, he wasn't using a lot of uh, jargon and a lot of you know kind of philosophy speak. It was very easy to understand, very conversational, and I think that's. You know, I obviously welcome that, but I think it will be um, really, really, really wonderful for for the listeners. So I'm, I'm very, um, again, was very pleasantly surprised uh, at how uh, brilliant Richard is at, you know, getting really hard topics and concepts and just absolutely distilling it in a way that's understandable. I mean, anyone that's read Heidegger knows that Heidegger is is tough in some some sections and in some. Uh, books, so it's it's a absolute uh, mastery of, of Richard's uh, um, skill and, and knowledge. We start by talking about Dasein. You can't get very far into Heidegger without talking about Dasein. We talk about what it is. We talk about how Dasein is possessive and different from other types of being. We talk about Heidegger's ideas of authenticity and inauthenticity. We talk about the three forms of Dasein. We talk about being as metaphysics. Uh, and we spend a little bit of time, which I, I really enjoy this part of the conversation as well, uh, about the role of Aristotle's philosophy on Heidegger's philosophy. Uh, we talk about the quote-unquote turn, um, Heidegger's turn in the 30s um, in his philosophical thought. We talk about being in the world. Um, this is kind of uh, hyphenated uh, four-word phrase and what that means. We spend some time in worldhood. We talk about the four senses of world, the idea of a shared world, what that means. We talk about environment, present at hand, ready to hand, many of these you know, essential features of Heidegger's philosophy. And we talk about care and thrownness. This is a topic I was most interested in because I don't hear it talked about enough. And so Richard was you know, brilliant in, the, in this section. We talk about Heidegger's notions of uh, anxiety, what that means, how it's different from Kierkegaard or Husserl or, or even Sartre. How, how does he look at anxiety? We talk about how Heidegger's philosophy can improve psychology and the social sciences at large. We talk about Heidegger on language. We talk about, um, towards the end, which was a really, it felt, again, this part of the uh, conversation felt the most conversational. We talk about Heidegger's Nazism. Obviously, he was a part of the Nazi party. Um, again, I've mentioned that at various points in other conversations, but um, I think the way in which we talked about it and some of the ways we brought it up were uh, fresh and interesting. And, and of course, uh, Richard has, um, you know, Obviously, you can read the original German, and he's seen some of the, the letters and other things that keep getting translated, um, and kind of gave some kind of new ideas about how we understand um, Heidegger's personal uh, issues and challenges. And then we 
end with talking about Heidegger and technology. Um, obviously, Heidegger wrote a really big essay that's you know been talked about and shared uh, in our digital age, and so we talk about that. Um, I have to say, for anyone that's listened to the podcast, they know that I'm a, a big fan of Heidegger's philosophy, and so I was absolutely um, you know honored and really rewarded with this conversation. Um, again, Richard is, is quite brilliant, um, super, super wonderful. And we just had a really good, uh, conversation on Heidegger's philosophy and, and, uh, some of the aspects of who he was as a person. And so I'm really pleased to bring you Richard Polt. I'm here with Richard Polt. Uh, Richard, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. I'm very much looking forward to uh, to talking with you uh, today, all about uh, Heidegger predominantly. Um, so, thanks for coming up. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, for listeners that don't know who you are, just tell us the bite-sized version of uh, your background, uh, what you uh, teach on, what you any work you've done, anything you've published, um, any of the the particulars that are relevant here. Oh, I'm a professor of philosophy at Xavier University in Cincinnati, and um, been here for 30 years. Hmm. I, my specialty is Heidegger, although I've branched out a bit in my publications and a lot in my uh, teaching. So with Heidegger, I've done a number of things, um, editorial work, translation, uh, a general introduction called Heidegger, an introduction, and a couple of more specialized uh, books called the emergency of being and time and trauma, which are both focused on Heidegger in the 1930s. Mm. Um, you know, my broader philosophical interests are pretty wide ranging. I'm teaching a course on the philosophy of time mm. right now, and nice. I've also taught courses on memory, history, and various um, historical figures such as Plato. Mm. Um, so uh, I have a lot of interest. No, that's that's absolutely wonderful. I mean, you've 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 hit some of the really interesting topics there. Um, as I was saying before, we <clears throat> we hit record. I I'm a big fan of Heidegger uh, in his in terms of his philosophy. I um I I've talked about him a, a handful of times here on the podcast with wonderful uh, folks, and so I really wanted to focus more on. Um, some of the aspects of his philosophy that get uh, kind of just kind of the cursory or just kind of brushed over. Um, obviously, we'll talk about Dasein and Bean, but um, uh, some of the other aspects that are really interesting to me as well that I feel like don't get talked about enough, such as the term, uh, contributions, uh, care, all these different types of topics that I don't hear talked about as much if I hear people talk about him. So I'll be very interested to hear um, some of your thoughts. And, um, yeah, just a quick note. Um, I know you, you were part of the, the, the duo that did the translation for the introduction of metaphysics. Uh, just uh, what was that experience like to uh, translate Heidegger and, you know, you guys were at the introduction and like, that's, that has to be such a really, um, fun experience, but I'm sure very, very, a lot of hard work went into it, trying to get it right. And, but, um, you know, obviously translation is a little bit different than, you know, uh, your, your kind of own thoughts on it, but how, how, what was that process like to be so close to kind of the work and looking at the German and all that? How, how was that? Yeah, I did that with Gregory Freed, who's a very old friend and we've done a lot of things together. Um, and as you say, it was fun and it was work. Yeah. Um, it's, it's the closest way to read a text. Uh, sometimes it can get too close, you lose the, the forest for the trees. But mm -hmm. um, it's it's really interesting to, to dig into the word play, which there's a lot of in that text. Um, not just play, but sort of serious delving into the German language and um, sets of related words, and then just wondering, are there parallels in English? And of course, mm -hmm. the parallels are never mathematical parallels, you know, different languages have different connotations. And so uh, but sometimes we found good solutions, and that's that's kind of a wonderful thing to discover the resources in your own language to do mm. that. So, mm. so that was fascinating. And then Greg and I have also translated a volume called Being and Truth, mm. which contains two lecture courses from 1933-34, and one called Nature, History, and State, which records a seminar from that same year, which if you know your Heidegger, you know that that was his most Hitlerian year. So yeah. those are very politically important uh, mm. texts. Mm. 
That's super, super cool that you're able to, you've been able to do that. And as I'm sure we'll mention at some point, you know, some of the things from German don't translate to English. So if people have read Being in Time, the big magnum opus, some of these words that are all hyphenated or other things are there because there's, you know, some very long German word that just doesn't (laughs) necessarily translate into English. And so there's a, there's a, it's a, it's a kind of workaround to try and get at it. So that will be really interesting to hear some of your insights on some of the, the ways in which people have interpreted things from the English. So um, obviously I think the biggest, we'll, we'll talk about many things, but let's, let's talk about the first, the first, the biggest thing, which again is, is, is all through the introduction of metaphysics. Obviously it's huge in being in time is this idea of um, Dasein. Um, that's uh, kind of his big, one of the big concepts that he has. So maybe tell us about what is Dasein, how did he, what was he trying? There's obviously the literal translation of of, uh, the two German words, but what was he trying to get at conceptually and philosophically? Um, Yeah, we start with that and get into it. Mm -hmm. So literally, as probably most of your listeners know, it means being there, or it can also be translated as being here. So even the the German word da doesn't have a perfect correspondence in English, like and you say, diestis, there it is, here it is. Mm. Um, but it's a, it's a way of being, right? And in everyday German, it means, it's used just like we use the word existence. So you can talk about the Dasein of God or the Dasein of a car or the, the Dasein of a particular number in mathematics. But uh, for Heidegger, he reserves it for, let's say, humans for the time being, mm-hmm. human-like entities. <laughs> Uh, and that's because we are there in a way that other entities aren't. Mm. So we, we have a there or a world or a meaningful space, which we inhabit in a way that other things don't. So, so a car is there in the world, but not the way we're there in the world. The, the car, um, nothing means anything to the car as far as we can tell. Mm-hmm. Um, the car is uh, ready to hand, as he puts it, it's available for our use in the world, uh, and it's present in that world. Um, but we we're familiar with the world. We inhabit it. It's our home. We belong there, or we can fail to belong. Um, and the world for Heidegger, or the there, again is a meaningful space it's it's where we interpret things it's where things have significance for us so all of that is uh, intended to be conveyed in that word dasein he says there that in, in, in being in time and elsewhere that it's possessive meaning it's your dasein is is only yours right you can't have somebody else's dasein so let me be you know pull this out for us so dasein is a type of of being right in terms of his whole ontological way of, of understanding things but mm-hmm. how do we understand dasein for for each person as a possessive that it's only ours there's this possessive quality to it well each each design is mine um this this is another great word yay meinigkeit in each case mindness so you know your your existence is yours and mine is mine um meaning that i'm responsible for my own being as it's been given over to me uh, I, you know, I wake up in the morning and I find that, oh, here I am. I have to be myself again. <laughs> and that's, that's a task, uh, whether I embrace that joyfully or I find it to be a terrible burden. Um, it's a task that's given to me and nobody can come in and say, oh, that's all right. I'll just take care of being you today. Mm-hmm. Right? Um, mm-hmm. Now, somebody could come in and teach my class for me or, or substitute for me in many, if not possibly all of the roles I play in the world. And yet still, they can't be me for me. Mm -hmm. Um, That's most obvious when it comes to my death, right? So somebody can take a bullet for me and in that way, give their life for me, which is a very profound act. But after they've done that, here I still am, still mortal, still having to face my own death. So um, it seems to be something that, that, you know, my possible non-existence as well as my daily existence seem to be put in my 
hands uh, and not in the hands of anyone else. Yeah, he makes this distinction as well between, I mean, many people, if they've read Being in Time or other works, they'll, they'll see that he will go to great lengths to really flush this out, uh, you know, he's spending pages and pages and pages, you know, very laboriously going over this. And um, one of the things about Dasein is that it, it seems to be pretty uh, uh, human, uh, maybe other life forms, you know, there's a, there's a question mark there. I mean, as far as I know, Do uh, Heidegger didn't talk too much about animals or other um, sentient life forms, as we call them, although there's some of that there. But how do we understand Dasein as from just existence of other things or from the other uh, term that's used, existentials, right? How, how do we understand the differences here? The differences between Dasein and, and other kinds of beings? Yes, yes. Yeah, well, um, let me. This might be a bit of a sidetrack, but he does talk about animals in one really interesting lecture course from 1929, mm. 1930, called "The Fundamental Concepts of Metaphysics," mm. um, which has been which has gotten a lot of attention since it was published um, after his death, and especially recently with concerns about animal rights and mm. and anthropocentrism, various kinds. Um, so he says that or, or he proposes for our consideration the following set of statements um the the stone is worldless the animal is world poor hmm. and uh, dasein i forget what the phrase is that he uses but essentially dasein has a world in the full sense and hmm. is in the world so he's making a type of hierarchy here Right. Hmm. Um, and people object to this now because, well, what do you mean animals are world poor? Well, you know, aren't we animals too? And isn't this species centric? And so on. Mm -hmm. You can sort of predict how that conversation um, goes. Um, <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> to me, though, it seems pretty plausible, actually. And, and he bases it on, he's more empirical in this lecture course than in many others, mm -hmm. uh, where he actually looks at scientific studies of bees, for instance, hmm. um, and how they behave. And in some sense, they clearly do have a world. So they have an environment in the biological sense. They're part of an ecological system. They relate to things other than bees, and they carry information to each other about those things. They function uh, within that world. But it's an impoverished world in the sense that it's a limited set of opportunities for behavior. Um, he calls it a, a ring of disinhibitions. Hmm. So it's as if the, normally the animal is inhibited, hemmed in, and then it gets disinhibited by certain stimuli and reacts uh, in a certain way. Um, but it never really manages to break out of that ring. It can't um, radically broaden the kind of the ways in which it encounters other entities. So for the bee, a flower is always going to be a, a source of pollen, uh, nectar, and, and that's it. Um, for humans, we can rethink what a flower is. We can adopt all sorts of historically transforming uh, relations to it. We can ask, what does it mean to be a flower? Mm. Uh, and the reason is that we can ask what it means to be ourselves. Right? So with, that's initially a very personal question. It's part of that, Yemanikite, who am I? Mm -hmm. I wake up in the morning and implicitly or explicitly, I have to come to some decision about who I am. Mm. Um, the bee never has to do that. It's, mm. it's very lucky in a way. It just has its being kind of handed to it by its nature, and it just is a bee. Mm. So animals um, have a world in that restricted, ahistorical way. Um, of course, they can change. There's evolution. He doesn't deny that. Mm -hmm. But they can't historically come to grips with who they are. That's just not a question for them. Mm -hmm. um, but it is for us. And then the stone just doesn't have a world at all. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, quote, in the world. And, you know, we can see it. There it is. It's in space. But for the stone itself, of course, as far as we can tell, there's no, um, there's no freedom. There's no consciousness. There's no problem of how to be mm -hmm. a stone. It is interesting. I mean, it is an interesting hierarchy. I don't entirely um, resist it. Um, I have to I have to read the, the those lectures, but I, I just finished a book on um, called "The Mind of a Bee" by Lars uh, Chitka, who um, he. 
I mean, that's what he studies. He studies the ecology of bees. And so he basically talks about the very, very, very complex ways in which their minds work. Um, and, you know, the question that some people have asked um, is, you know, what level of consciousness, if any, do they have? But they're, they're highly intelligent. So they have amazing cognitive abilities, you know, spatial learning, et cetera. And even with all of that, you know, fresh in my mind, I still don't think Heidegger's uh, framework is a wrong one. There is obviously something that makes them different or other, let's say, animals or other kinds of organisms from humans. Right? And I would say mostly this in some terms of the neurological implications is this form of not just intelligence, but this form of abstraction and executive functioning and very, very complex ways of looking at things that doesn't make us better or or worse but it does make us uh stand out or different from other organisms mm -hmm. so it's very interesting how he, he thinks of it that way so i, I want to ask about authenticity and inauthenticity because he talks about that a lot of other people have talked about that after him but um th this might be a little bit in the weeds but just in terms of the the differences with with design there's and being in time i was looking this up there seems to be three parts here, the ontical, uh, the ontological, and the ontico-ontological. Um, if it's relevant, is it important to kind of tease out how he means these three subtypes or differences with Dasein? Um, yes. Well, let me first address the basic concept of authenticity, and then we can get into the terminology. So, mm -hmm. um, authentic in German, eigentlich, um, it's, it's related, uh, at least in sound, I believe etymologically too, to the word eigen, which means own. Mm. So eigentlich means owned or one's own or proper. So you can exist either properly slash authentically or improperly slash inauthentically. Um, and just to go back to the simple experience of waking up in the morning and having to be somebody and coming to some explicit or implicit decision about who you are. Well, normally it's it's an implicit decision. It's kind of taken for granted. Oh, you know, it's 7 a.m. I better get dressed, you know, drink my coffee and get to work. You've already decided um, without making a really deep decision that you are still the person you were yesterday. And that's how we have to function normally to get by in what he calls everydayness. Mm -hmm. But that's inauthentic because even though my existence is radically my own, I'm not really owning up to it, as it were, because I'm not coming to grips with the problem of who I am. Um, obviously, that doesn't mean you you ought to be authentic at every moment because you'd go insane, right? <laughs> um, you can really only be authentic if you're faced with a midlife crisis or a moment of anxiety or some radical yeah. uh, challenge that you never know when it's going to turn up, but uh, it does sometimes. Um, let's Let's bring in the vocabulary you mentioned. So, so first of all, English is confusing because we have this word being, which can mean either something that is mm -hmm. or what it means to be, mm -hmm. right? And in German, there isn't that confusion because there's das Seiende, that which is, and das Sein, which is the infinitive, the to mm -hmm. be. Mm -hmm. So um, I think since we're audio only here on the podcast, I'm going to use the word entity rather than a being. So mm -hmm. an entity is anything that is in any way hmm. and then being i will try to use only for the to be in other words what it means for that kind of entity to be hmm. okay i'm sure so, there's a there's a very um, nice way of illustrating this on a chalkboard or on a whiteboard and you know in a in a, in a classroom setting <laughs> it, it would help to have a, a whiteboard but I, I think people can can follow sure just yeah no. so so um so design is a particular kind of entity and it has a special way of being. Um, interestingly, the word Dasein means being there. So he's given this entity a name which refers immediately to its kind of being. Mm -hmm. um, why didn't he just say humans or something? Um, right. Well, what's special about humans, he thinks, is that we have this unique way of being mm -hmm. that, say, bees do not. Mm -hmm. And so he chose this word Dasein. Mm -hmm. Which actually leaves it open whether or not all humans attain that form of being, mm -hmm. uh, and whether other species, maybe you know, dolphins or aliens on some other planet, might actually also be Dasein. Mm -hmm. um, 
the meaning of the word being get, gets very complex, but uh, and we can get deeper into it as you wish. But but for the time being, as it were, um, <laughs> for, for the time being, um, I have to come to grips with my being every day, mm-hmm. uh, authentically or inauthentically. In other words, who am I? Mm. Um, that. Uh, I better introduce some more terminology. This is what he calls an existential question, mm-hmm. ending in I E L L, existential, mm-hmm. meaning it's a personal, individual um, question about my own situation. You know, who am I, Richard Polt? Uh, you can also raise existential questions, A L, which are more theoretical questions about uh, the meaning of human existence mm-hmm. as the form of being of the entity that humans are. Uh, and then there are these words ontical and ontological. So ontical means having to do with entities. Ontological means having to do with being. Hmm. So for instance, um, what time is it right now is an ontical question. Um, or let's say, what does my watch say right now is an ontical question. What is time itself is an ontological one. Hmm. Or, you know, why did that bee sting me is ontical. What's the being of bees is ontological. Hmm. Now, um, among Dasein's qualities is this very special quality of being ontological in the sense that uh, all Dasein care about the meaning of being. Hmm. So this is one of the central kind of nuggets of thought that led to this this long unfinished book, Being in Time. Um, so we know that I I care about my own being just by getting up in the morning and doing something and and taking a stand, usually without much reflection on how I'm going to behave. So I care about who I am. I care about my own being, and I also care about the being of all other entities that I encounter in the world and I have some understanding of what it means for them to be, Hmm. which seems like a huge leap, right? Why would I go from caring about my own being to caring about all being in general? And I think the connection is that part of the way Dasein exists, an essential part is that we are in the world as a meaningful space where we encounter all sorts of meaningful things. Uh, In other words, I can't be myself without encountering other entities and having some sort of interpretation of them. Mm. So if I get up and just sort of assume I'm going to be a professor for another day, that involves some relationship to the university, to my colleagues, to the car that I drive to work, and so on and so on. And and I have an interpretation of those things. that I must have in order to have an interpretation of myself. So the meaning, the the being of all those entities means something to me, even though I would be hard pressed to, to put it into words. Yeah. It it seems like this is that concept of, of the other, right? Where we have to, or we don't have to, but we are always in relation to, to something or some, someone. And, you know, we don't, we don't exist in a vacuum. We don't exist in a vat, right? We exist in a, in a world, which we'll get to, but in a world and with other people that have Dasein or, or other types of beings with other entities. And this it's it's interesting because he's 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 trying to explain all the way at bottom what it is to be but then also then moving outwards and saying yes but then how do we understand that in context it sounds you know how do, how do we understand our our being within the context of 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 other beings and so is this where his question of being is a question of metaphysics right so so in the in the 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 short book with his, uh, you know, lectures or whatever the chapters on, on metaphysics is this because he, it's, it's like everything becomes, um, how do I say it? Like one's own Dasein becomes their kind of reference point for how they're operating in the world. So everything is kind of loaded into that or loaded out of that. So is, is this where, you know, this question of being is inextricably linked to metaphysical questions or and or uh, questions of truth whatever that may be how do we understand how being is connected with those concepts 
Well, of course, we have to define the word metaphysics, and that's a <laughs> historical discussion partly, and it's also complicated because Heidegger likes or dislikes the word uh, differently at different stages in his thought. Um, so to give a little historical background, um, the word metaphysics originates in the editorial process for Aristotle's works. So it's not a word that ever appears in Plato or Aristotle, but there is a book by Aristotle, which we now call the metaphysics. Uh, the story, apparently, it's, it seems too absurd to be true, but the, the story seems to be that an editor at a certain point didn't know what to do with these particularly bizarre texts and just said, well, I'll put it after the physics and we'll call it the metaphysics. Uh, <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> but what, what Aristotle calls it is first philosophy. So it's supposed to be the most fundamental that gets at the very um, basic questions about everything or about being qua being, as he puts it. Um, in other words, what does it mean um, it, it looks at everything that is uh, just insofar as it is and not insofar as it is a particular sort of thing, mm -hmm. asks, what is it to be? Um, and Aristotle develops a rather complex theory about this, which, which interested Heidegger from early on, according to what he says, when he was still a schoolboy, he got this book uh, by Brentano called um, On the Manifold Meaning of Being in Aristotle. So Aristotle, who loves to make distinctions, says being is said in many ways. So being can sometimes mean truth, like, yeah, it is that way, that's true. Mm. Or it can mean um, the distinction between actual and potential, which is very important for Aristotle. So mm. to be fully is to be fully actual. Uh, to have the potential to be is not nothing, but it's not full being. And then there are different kinds of beings. There's, there's, he assumes, Aristotle assumes that, that the most important kind of being is an individual um, which uh, can exist on its own and is uh, self-sufficient to a certain degree and then can have various properties or qualities. For instance, an individual uh, bee, since we're talking about bees, um, has various properties, relations, uh, it's a member of the species B, but um, its its way of being, so to speak, <laughs> is primarily to be an individual. Um, so we don't have to get farther into Aristotle, but that's how the metaphysical tradition under that name gets going. Well, so Heidegger was very steeped in that and, and um, built being in time partly um, with inspiration from Aristotle. I was I was going to I was going to jump in here and say that yes I, I I do actually think Aristotle is important in understanding Heidegger because if I recall I could be wrong on this but I think Aristotle was the number one person he lectured the most on and then Nietzsche was second to that and so I mean he spent a lot of time in Aristotle and and if you've I mean obviously I mean, you have but if, if anybody has read Heidegger's lectures or works on Aristotle. Um, and this idea of being, he's basically funneling, you know, the, these distinctions and categorizations that Aristotle is making through his, uh, um, you know, kind of way of uh, his system of understanding Dasein and being. So I, I do actually think it is, it's very, very um, instructive. It, what you're saying. it is. Yeah. In the, in the first half of the 1920s, definitely. He's very interested in, in close readings of Aristotle and he, Apparently, what he did was very innovative for the time that he read Aristotle as a phenomenologist, in other words, not just as a sort of systematic uh, thinker, but as somebody who's paying extremely close attention to the nuances of experience. And Heidegger was digging into um, Aristotelian texts on a very fine grained mm -hmm. level. Um, and I would say not just applying his concepts to them, but developing his concepts together with mm. Aristotle. Mm. So the, the way that this uh, Aristotelian metaphysics is reflected in being time is that he says um, something that Aristotle could have said uh, early in the inter introduction to being time. He says each special science or field of study looks at a certain field of entities. Uh, for instance, the historian will look at historical events, um, the mathematician at mathematical relations, and so on. And 
at the basis of that science or research is some set of assumptions about what it means to be that kind of entity. Mm. Uh, and then this calls for philosophical reflection, ontological reflection on the on those ways of being, and then on the more general question, uh, what does it mean to be in general? Is there some single meaning of being that governs the being of historical events and the being of mathematical objects? Or, And then an even deeper question, which is, how do we have any understanding of being at all? What makes that possible? Why, why are we this special kind of entity for whom being means anything? Mm -hmm. So um, he doesn't call that metaphysics and being in time, but I think it's, it's continuous in some ways with the metaphysical tradition. Mm. Um, then in the next few years, uh, when he gives uh, a famous 1929 talk called what is metaphysics? And then 1935 is the lecture course introduction to metaphysics. He's using metaphysics in a pretty positive way as sort of the human venture into the question of being. Uh, after that, though, he, he tends to use it pejoratively. And, and what he means is that metaphysics, uh, as it has developed, becomes a process of uh, categorizing entities finding universal concepts for them and very often identifying a supreme entity mm -hmm. god or whatever it may be mm -hmm. uh, system systematizing all that but never really asking that deeper question which is why do we have an understanding of being at all why why is it the case that Dasein is such a special entity mm -hmm. for whom being is in question so if you just sort of uh, take it for granted that we are understanding entities in their being, you're not asking that deeper question, which is where um, he wants to begin his really distinctive uh, way of thinking. Yeah, and I, and I think a lot of his critiques of much of Western philosophy up to that point was this fact was, well, everyone's making this assumption that we just know what this is. And then we talk about all these other distinctions. Um, <clears throat> And so I think he does this, he has a lot of work on the cogito. He does a lot of work with many, many f uh, philosophers that had asked similar types of questions, but his thing was like, okay, but at bottom, what is this thing or this, whatever we're discussing. And so, um, listeners might be, uh, you know, wanting the, the big reveal here. So what did he find out? What was his answer? And unfortunately, like in much, much of philosophy, you don't, you don't get the, you know, <laughs> definitive answer here, but I guess maybe I'll just ask, you kind of alluded to it here since we're here, there was, um, there's, there's definitely something that is early Heidegger, which is what we see in beginning time. And then there's this whole turn, uh, piece, you know, the whole turn that he had and there's late Heidegger where he, it looks very, very different. Um, so maybe just say, how does his, Again, much of his philosophy is is about being, um, but how does this his ideas of being evolve over time? I mean, he lived until nineteen eighty, I think is when it was when he uh, died. Seventy six. Yeah. Seventy six. Excuse me. And you know, so anyway, he lived much of the twentieth century. Um, so yeah, just how how did his his thought evolve on this question of being? Yeah. So. Um as you as you said, philosophers don't necessarily come up with answers, and and Heidegger is sort of notorious for ending with not ending, right? With with questions. Um, yeah. He says in the fifties that questioning is the piety of thought. Mm. So, um, being in time is nineteen twenty seven, and the title comes from a hypothesis. Uh, so, reading from page one of Being in Time. Our provisional aim is the interpretation of time as the possible horizon for any understanding whatsoever of being. Meaning that uh, his hypothesis is that whenever we understand what it means to be for a particular kind of entity or ourselves or just in general, we're relying on time as our horizon. In other words, the context that makes such a concept meaningful and possible. So his his provisional answer there to his question, you know, what enables us to understand being is time. Yeah. And now I'll turn to the last page of being time in the last sentence, which is a question. Mm 
does time itself manifest itself as the horizon of being? <laughs> to be to be fair, I have both of these uh, underlined in my copy, so I have oh, good. <laughs> so, so he lost some certainty over the course of writing the book. It seems right. <laughs> uh, it is unfinished, and so there was going to be quite a bit more. But in the very next uh, section that he was planning to publish, and that he did apparently draft pretty extensively, hmm. he was going to explain how that worked, but he decided that that it was a dead end. Hmm. Um, why did he decide that is a controversial question. Um, I recommend a recent anthology edited by Lee Braver called Division Three of Being in Time, The yeah. Unanswered Question hmm. of Being. Nice. So there are various articles there in which people, including me, try to, you know, speculate about a book that doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. um, it feels, it feels a little bit like kind of like will to power, where there's all these notes and ideas for the big magnum opus that uh, Nietzsche yeah. wanted to do and you know, got sick and all that and, and couldn't finish it. But uh, but it, it's it's interesting, though, right? Because he lived a really long time after this and he never went back to it. I mean, but it, that's what, but he, his his philosophy does evolve, though, and, and shift a little yes. bit. Um, yeah, so my my recent book, Time and Trauma, uh, Thinking Through Heidegger in the 30s, is about um, how that evolved. And then his period of the 30s, broadly defined, you know, 1929 to the end of World War II, mm -hmm. um, which is sometimes called Heidegger's middle period. Mm -hmm. And then there's a late period. So we can, you know, periodize in various ways. But, but mm -hmm. clearly, there's a lot of turmoil in his thinking mm -hmm. after being in time. Um, it's published in 1927. It's unfinished. Everybody says, okay, where, where's the rest of it? But Heidegger himself feels a lot of doubt. Um, he's also um, suddenly becomes world famous mm. due to this book. I mean, people recognized it right away. Before that, he was sort of a, a well-kept secret uh, in certain philosophical ger German circles, but he hadn't published much. Then he comes out with this masterpiece. Um, and he uh, gets a prestigious chair of philosophy that used to be Husserl's chair. And, uh, but he doesn't rest on his laurels. He's really struggling with questions like, um, like the question of the being of animals, which we got into is sort of a, a sideline, but um, you know, a question that emerges from mm -hmm. being in time. Um, what I see happening is that he starts to ask, uh, well, what's the origin of Dasein? So being in time is is static in a, in a sort of way, and that he he describes well. Here's here's how we are, um, but he starts asking questions in lecture courses and in some notes about well, what's the origin of Dasein's temporality? How does that even come about? What's the origin of world? What's the um, how do we enter into the condition of Dasein? So he's starting to think more about a radical historical event, or even an event that gets history going in some sense so almost like a um, like his version of like an origin story or, or like a genesis of sorts of trying to figure out yeah. like where does this come from yes and it's maybe that's really a question that can't be answered because as soon as you tell a story you're already coming from within a certain world but, right, you know. but there's a problem there there's a question that that is uh in my reading bothering him quite a lot mm. um and it has to do with history. Uh, in in being in time, he says that Heidegger he says that Dasein is deeply historical, mm. but the book itself seems sort of ahistorical. As I said, it's just sort of describing the way Dasein quasi eternally is. Um, so, what about Heidegger's own historical position? And uh, in the thirties, when you know there's a worldwide economic and political crisis and the rise of the Nazis. He, you know, unfortunately gets swept up in that and he starts asking more historically, who are we uh, Westerners, Germans, uh, what are we to do at this junction? Um, so his, his philosophy looks much more political, much more engaged, hmm. uh, rightly or wrongly. And he also turns, he feels free to turn to texts that are not considered part of philosophy, such as the poetry of Friedrich Hölderlin. Hmm. Um, and he goes off in, in directions that are, uh, from the point of view of analytic philosophy, really disastrous, you know, very irrational, very arbitrary, very, uh, dogmatic and obscure and, and bizarre. Um, but also fascinating hmm. to me. Where, where is it that we get, um, 
his his thought i don't know if it's middle heidegger or later heidegger where um you know contributions to philosophy uh of the event is, is that the is that yes. the title of the book um, is that's, in the 50s actually that's 1936 to 38 uh -huh. um and i have a book about that book that's uh, my book is called the emergency of being uh, on Heidegger's mm -hmm. contributions to philosophy so this was a book that uh, very few people knew existed mm. um until after Heidegger's death and it was published only in 1989. Mm. Um, in a way it's not really a book it's a collection of notes um, and a lot of these posthumously published texts I mean, Heidegger was by the way just um a graphomaniac who was constantly writing and uh, his collected works are about 100 volumes Plus, there are another thirty volumes projected of correspondence and a lot of other things in the archives. And, uh, but this volume was published in 1989, and um, it's very different from being in time. It is a collection of notes, not haphazard, um, but loosely organized and often cryptic, and using a lot of poetic language that's rather hard to decipher. Mm um and at the center of it is this word uh, that's often translated as event and in normal german does mean event uh, ereignis so uh there as in eigentlichkeit there is that that sound eigen mm -hmm. and even though there isn't an etymological connection in this case heidegger is definitely playing on that mm -hmm. um connection in sound between eigen or own and Ereignis event. So it's sometimes translated as the event of appropriation or the appropriating mm. event, mm. or um, some translators made up a new word for it, an owning. Mm. Um, and whether it isn't really an event in any sense of the word is controversial mm. still today. Um, my friend Tom Sheehan says this has nothing to do whatsoever with a happening or an event or an occurrence. <laughs> uh, it's basically a structure of Dasein that was already discussed in different words in being in time. Mm. In my interpretation, though, yes, it is an event. It's the ultimate event. It is this event of the origination of uh, Dasein as such. So mm. uh, we still don't know what he means. Mm. Yeah, I've, I haven't read all of it. I've read parts of it, and it's it is a it's a hard book. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a tough book to get through. Um, the only other one that kind of tops it is, uh, his, um, I think it came out recently, if I'm not mistaken, at least in English was his lectures on Heraclitus or Heraclitus, mm. I guess is the, the right way to say it. Oh, um, way. And, uh, that was tough. Right. I, so I, I, I said it before I went to, uh, a reform seminary and so i learned you know greek um but uh definitely not that kind of greek and koine greek has these different iterations as homeric greek and there's the greek for the bible and things like that but um but uh it, it, it's okay but it, i haven't used it in a long time and it, there's just i mean half the book is basically written in greek so <laughs> it's a it is it is a tough book but the parts i got out of it were uh, wonderful because you know Heraclitus is a fantastic you know philosopher and I mean well before his time and so but it was a tough book that was I mean it's a series of lectures and it was it was tough I mean it was it was really tough to get through um, the event is also tough but just in a different way I, it's very kind of like this cryptic and kind of like what's going on here and it's it's not as linear um, I would say as being in time was um, so that's yeah. true and, and there are other um volumes of this sort that have been published and translated since then one of them is simply called the event mm. so that's a distinct text from contributions to philosophy of the event mm. uh, but he keeps on being fascinated by this word ereignis and playing with it in many ways mm. he's really working very hard to to find the right words um a lot of these posthumously published texts get very repetitious because they're sort of notes to self or, or mm. Mm. Um, the workshops in which he's trying to generate new vocabulary. Um, they also tend to be extremely abstract. And so you, you don't know, you know, being in time is also a very abstract book, but once in a while he'll give you a wonderfully illuminating example that's, that's very down to earth. Mm. Um, in contributions to philosophy, there are very few such things, although there are references to contemporary events uh, and his take on them. Mm. And there are various sarcastic critical remarks on all sorts of ideologies of the time. Mm. 
<laughs> well, he definitely has a yeah, definitely has a style, and there's a certain type of humor that comes out that you, you kind of have to sometimes squint to see, but it's sometimes yeah. there. Sarcasm, um, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so I, I want to. I, I, I want to talk to you about worldhood. I think it's it's interesting. I haven't talked a lot about his ideas of, of worldhood uh, here, and, and they're really, really fascinating. We were already touching on that earlier. I'm going to start this bit of the conversation by asking if you've, I, I will assume that you have, but uh, if you've seen any film by Terrence Malick. I have. Yeah, so for I've said this on different points, but... Um, the story is with, with Terry Malick. So for those that haven't seen it, um, you know, he did works like um, Badlands and The Thin Red Line and The Tree of Life, which is a spectacular film. Um, the New World, which is actually pretty good, too. Some other ones that he's done. He did a new one recently. Um, uh, I forget the name of it. Which is, it was very good. But Tree of Life is the one I think that really in, sticks out for a lot of people. It's a fabulous film. And basically, Terry Malick is doing uh, Heidegger's philosophy of worldhood um, on film. That is essentially what he's doing. That's why it's very, he takes like, you know, 10 years in post production, just, you know, editing nightmare. <laughs> he films, it's, it's a very, it, it, his films are very non linear. They're not really with a, uh, you know, necessarily a plot per se, but they're absolutely gorgeous films. Um, and he's, He's literally trying to capture that idea of being in the world and what that's like and what that's like for, for various individuals. Um, and his, I find his, his films beautiful. Um, but the story is, is that he was uh, writing a dissertation on Heidegger and, you know, people didn't like his ideas and cause he wanted to try and fuse, you know, his idea of worldhood with other types of things I forget. So he left and he said, well, I'm just going to make movies instead about it. And that's what he's been doing for 45, 50 years. I do know that he met Heidegger allegedly, um, when, in the, in the last couple of days, you know, when he was in the black forest or whatever in the seventies, um, and they had a you know weekend discussion that he never talks about and terry malick himself is kind of a recluse he doesn't really do interviews and promotion for his own films and things like that and so um but apparently he was like a actual scholar of of heidegger's work and stuff like that and so anyways once i read that i mean i couldn't watch his films any other way i just was like that's all i was seeing it's just this phenomenological kind of <clears throat> uh visual <laughs> exposition on, on worldhood. Um, so I usually point to people of, you know, if you read some of the stuff on Heidegger's worldhood and then go watch a Terry Malick film and then it just like, it will just kind of hit you in certain ways. So I, I'm assuming, I don't know if you know the story, but I'm assuming you, again, that you had seen his films and stuff. I have, I'm, I'm not an expert on the films, but I, I do admire them, especially the tree of life. You know, um, I have to say, I don't see like many very specific Heideggerian ideas there, but maybe you can enlighten me on that. I do see, you know, people trying to come to grips with the meaning of their existence um, mm -hmm. in a context which doesn't neatly fit into a stereotyped Hollywood drama, which existence usually doesn't. Mm -hmm. um, often there's a relationship to nature, too. And, yes, um, yes. And that's not so much there in being in time, but in, in the 30s and, and thereafter, Heidegger is very concerned with our relationship to the earth mm -hmm. and the, the, the points and moments where the human world um, kind of run, runs up against the natural world and shows its limits. Yeah. Um, I have, there's been a series of, I think, interviews. There's one a major interview and... Um, and uh, I think a couple pieces written on where he's talked about what he's specifically doing with some of his films. I don't know. It was before Tree of Life. It was some of his earlier stuff. So I have to find it and send it to you, and I'll, I'll try and remember to put it in the notes. But uh, it's interesting what he's what he's what he's doing. Um, but but about Heidegger's concepts here. So worldhood was was something again, kind of another big piece and kind of more of this uh, contextual framework, although not just only that. But so there's. So he talks about this thing called it's a hyphenated phrase being in the world, which, you know, you can uh, help us understand because he uses it a lot. And as far as I know that there's three distinctions uh, in the world entity and being in, which you've already mentioned some of those. Um, so just kind of tell us being in the world and then these kind of three distinctions from it. Okay. Um, yeah. He hyphenates it uh, in der Weltzeit because he wants to, 
keep those words together. Um, it's one unitary phenomenon, mm. which uh, is really crucial to our way of being that we are in the world. Um, and as a general orientation to that concept, he says that um, being in here is a kind of dwelling. So the world he means is um, a sort of a habitat, mm. not in the biological sense, but it's what we inhabit. It's our home, mm. um, being at home in some sort of context. And being in, in implies involvement. It's like, you know, like when you say I'm really into politics or I'm really into music, mm -hmm. that's the kind of being in, not just being plunked down in the center of some uh, space. <laughs> um, so I'm, we're, we're all into our context, mm. um, our meaningful context. Mm. Yeah. So I was in, in that, in that way, he's trying to make a distinction of this idea of dwelling that we're, we're a part of, um, uh, where we're at, right. I don't want to say just environment, but where we're at, we're mm -hmm. a part of it. We're not a kind of observer necessarily only, or we're not just a, uh, a, a, a passenger here. There is a kind of, it almost feels like a sort of participatory or an active, um, inference he's making there when he's talking about being in the world is, is is this about right yeah it's it's often hard to find the words you know for these really fundamental concepts because our words come in pairs right for every word there's an antonym and uh and when you try to get to really basic ontological uh features um there is no antonym because that's always the way it is no matter what <laughs> um his his favorite phrase is always already Mm. Right, Dasein is always already in the world. There is no moment when you are Dasein and you're deciding whether or not to get into the world. <laughs> right? As soon as you are capable of making decisions or or being anybody, mm. you're already in the world. Yeah. Um. So so we have to take these everyday words, such as you know, an expression such as where you're at, or having skin in the game, or being engaged, or caring, and and just kind of expand them and think of them more fundamentally, so that. Uh, for instance, with care, which is another word he uses, mm -hmm. um, you know, in everyday language, care has an antonym. In fact, it has three antonyms, um, carelessness, mm. uncaring, and carefreeness. Mm. So there, we certainly can be uncaring uh, in the sense of being cold and unempathetic, or we can be um, careless in the sense of being inconsiderate and, and irresponsible. Or we can be uh, carefree in, in that our, you know, we have very few burdens and we're lighthearted. But on a deeper level, all these are ways of caring. Uh, you can't be absolutely uncaring and still be human. Um, so, uh, and that is tied in with with being in the world, with being engaged in the world, being into the world. I definitely want to come back to care because I think it's important and that that will kind of branch out for the ideas that he has about, um, you know, this uh, ideas of death and existential anxiety, but I guess on the world of peace. So let me, he makes this distinction and I, and I've read this a bunch of times and there are four distinctions, um, that he makes and I want to try and understand them appropriately. Again, it's, it's he's a, he's doing a kind of system thing. Um, this is, uh, I got this from 93 in my translation of being in time. Yes. So there are four things in which he defines the four senses of the, of the world. So the ontical, which is, seems to be the total amount of entities that are present at hands, which we can discuss later or, or now, if it's relevant in the world, the ontological, which is being of those entities. So it seems like a type of universe of discourse, so kind of like a mathematical world or the world of a university or things like that is what it seems to be wherein where there's this living this is the public world and then worldhood which is this kind of large scale world or totality so what are these distinctions what's he trying to do and i guess the the big thing i want to know here is is why is he doing this because it seems like these distinctions are really important in a, in a variety of ways we we talk about the world, you know, the world of sports or the world in which we live in or in our communities or in our home or on the the globe or things like that. And we make all of these distinctions of 
how we are, where we are being in different ways. And we're always going in and out of these things. And so it sounds like he's trying to find that structure. So what are these four types of world and, and how is it important? Yeah, thanks. I think you gave a good overview. Um, I'll, I'll go into them in a little more depth. He's just trying yeah. to sort things out conceptually. Mm-hmm. Um, so before getting into the four types, just the, um, a difference in the ways we use world. So often people will use the world to mean the universe and everything in it. Mm-hmm. Right? It's, it's a collection of everything that there is in, quote, the world. But then world can also have a more psychological or cultural sense, like, um, like you really rock my world. I mean, <laughs> you know, that, that's not talking about the totality of things in the universe. That's about <laughs> right. shifting what things mean for me, mm-hmm. which in a way is a, is a deeper, more personally urgent issue, isn't it? Um, so first, so sense one, again, this is 93 of the Macquarie and Robinson translation. Mm-hmm. Or, um, 64 and 65 of the German. So world, which he's always going to put in scare quotes, <laughs> yeah. uh, means the totality of the entities, which can be present at hand within the world. Present at hand means roughly, you know, being a, a mere object. Um, there are a lot of things in the world other than mere objects, but they can all be present at hand. In other words, they can all just be regarded from that point of view. So if you just sort of made a, an objective list of items, uh, you know, the endless list of items that are in the universe, that would be world in quotation marks, sense number one. Um, world in sense number two is the being of those entities. And being here, the way he's using it, is more or less equivalent to essence or nature mm. of things. So... Um, a certain um, domain of the universe would be, let's say, uh, plants. Mm. So what is the being of plants? This is that that metaphysical question we were talking about, right? Where you can carve things up into different domains of entities and you can ask what what is their way of being? Mm. Um, sense three is more like you rock my world. It's, it's the world in which a factical Dasein lives. Um, so, you know, if you're a, a sports personality, you live in the world of sports, the world of celebrity, whatever it may be. Mm-hmm. If you're a physicist, you live in the world of science, uh, the world of academia, the world of industry, uh, and so on. There are different worlds in that sense. Um, they're not necessarily all public. And he says it may stand for the public we world or one's own closest domestic mm-hmm. environment, right? The world of my family. I might be really into that world. And then sense four is an abstraction from sense three. And this is what he's really interested in describing. So worldhood. What is it that makes a world in sense three a world? So if you take the world of my family, the world of industry, the world of sports, what do we mean by world there? Mm -hmm. Um, And that's what he's trying to describe as worldhood. Now, you you talked about it right before this. There's a, there's a shifting we do, right? We talk about we don't. I mean, I do it. You do, we all do it. We don't recognize it, right? You know. Well, you know, in, in you know, in 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 my world, right? You know, we'll say things like that, or or um, you know, well, you know, in 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 the world of academia, right? You know, and we're 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 shifting in all of these different ways, and so how in in these different um in, in these different uh, 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 settings or these these four senses. Where does I guess each one's own Dasein show up in how we're we're talking about these things, right? Because remember when we were talking earlier about well, we we have a context, right? And so we have the world in which we're living, right? And so where we are at and how we operate, and then how other people also operate. So where does he see in terms of the the relationship between your, one's own Dasein and, and and other types of being? And then within these four different uh, senses of the world, how, how do we see this kind of show up? Well, the, the last time I taught being in time um, a few years ago, 
my students kept raising questions like that, which are very good, but which he doesn't necessarily clarify about um, basically overlaps between my world and others' worlds and concentric worlds, if you will. I mean, it gets quite complex because, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm in the world of academia, but I'm also in the world of my family, right. uh, the world of Cincinnati and, and so on. Right. And my way of being in these worlds is never identical to the other's way of being in the world. Plus, um, these worlds can shift, right? They can shift in their meaning. And, um, and he kind of avoids a lot of those very concrete questions about how worlds interact and overlap and just tries to describe worldhood in general as if there were such a thing as the world. Um, now, one important point I, sh I should make right away to avoid misunderstanding is that he does not think that I'm locked into my particular world. Mm -hmm. So even if it is always going to be somewhat different from others, most of the time uh, I am simply an inhabitant of a shared world. Um, and I do what one does in that world, and I don't question that. So um, I'm anonymous in that way. Uh, and I'm always a communal being or a social being, if you want to put it that way. Mm. There is no such thing as, as one Dasein. Right, right, right. Because a single isolated Dasein would not be able to be Dasein. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely this sense of shared world. I mean, that we are having different experiences of that world, but there is definitely, you know, you know, with your colleagues at your university or right with your family or people in your community. We're in that same world, if you will. Um, but we're, you know, the, the where in, but we're, <clears throat> we're experiencing it differently. And so it, it is interesting to see when you put the, the other, uh, folks, you know, different from you is, you know, how we're inhabiting, uh, the same shared world, what that looks like, because, you know, folks are going to see it, you know, differently. So it's, it's, it's very peculiar. I guess that the other question here is, is and some people will say, well, what, isn't this just talking about the environment and not necessarily, right? <laughs> so he, how do we understand the environment? So he talks about it in, in the next few pages um, from where these, these four senses of the world, you know, so maybe environment is with subsumed within one or two of them or, but how do we understand how he means environment? Um, I think he talks about three modes. So con conspicuousness, obtrusiveness, and obstinacy, you know, maybe you could just describe the, the ideas he's trying to say about environment. And then we can talk about uh, sure. the present and ready to hand. Yeah. Here's, here's another case of difficult translation. So environment is umwelt, which literally just means around world. <laughs> so um, it's the world around us. Mm. And so the Umwelt is a particular kind of Welt. It's a particular kind of world, which is, which is very familiar and which he says we tend to overlook mm. uh, in philosophy and science. So what he means by Umwelt is the, the, the world of using and, and making and manipulating things. Mm. Um, something that seems sort of you know, for the for the theorist may seem sort of, you know, obvious and trivial, and let's get past that and figure out how things really are. But he wants to dwell first with that um, practical world, if you, if by practical you mean using things, making things. Yeah. Um, so I can see you, even your though your listeners will just get this on audio. We're over Zoom, so we can see each other. So so you're using equipment right now: some headphones, a mic, a shirt. <laughs> um, that's, those are all what he calls, um, ready to hand entities in your environment. Mm. Um, and as you use them, you're not taking them as present at hand objects. You're not staring at them and trying to objectively quantify them and you're just using them. And, um, that brings out, uh, distinctive aspects of them. Like the headphones might be comfortable. They might be too big. They might be too small. They might work better or, or not so well. Um, and without needing to objectify and theorize about things, um, we just use them practically and uh, get a sense of them that way. He's interested in this because when you look at how we do that, when you do theorize about it carefully, um, without falsely objectifying things, Mm -hmm. You realize that that useful things are part of a network of purposes uh, and significances. Mm. Right. So, so the yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. 
Well, well was, so, just please go ahead. Yeah, I was I was going to ask about this. It's, it's an important point, and and I, I want to. The, the the president ready to hand is always an interesting thing. This is where he usually gets in his idea about uh, hammers. Uh, he talks about, about hammers here and other tools or instruments. Um, I usually use uh, the example of a pen, right? Because it you know it's a, we use that all the time. Um, you know, there's this distinction between something being uh, present at hand. And then ready to hand, and and that one is is subsumed under the other, um, and so because something is is present at hand doesn't mean it's necessarily ready to hand, right? So I, I think of one as something as is a as a utility of sorts, right? Of that it's it's a it's a there's nothing obstructing it, there's nothing in the way to use it, but if it's just present to hand, you know, it's sitting there, the pen sitting on the table, and you know, let's say, you know, it's in, in a box or something like that, and I can't get to it or something, but it's there, and it, and it's there's an ability there, but maybe not at that moment. So I guess how do we how do we understand the two distinctions, and then how do we understand present ready to hand in terms of how he was trying to understand it for. Um, this this discussion on the environment and this kind of practical uses yeah. of things well there's been a lot of interpretations that, which are not all in agreement um a good book on this is by hubert dreyfus who founded a, mm -hmm. a whole tradition of english language heidegger interpretation so in his commentary uh on being time which division one which is called being in the world he pays a lot of attention to the the everyday environments to the ready to hand and and how the ready to hand can come to be revealed as present at hand um now this can break down in various ways so maybe um something is missing and i'm looking for it and and then i have to think uh, more um explicitly about why i need it uh, or maybe it breaks down my car won't start in the morning and we we know we know this sinking feeling oh my god now what uh, I've been depending on this thing that I just sort of assume is going to run every morning, and now it doesn't. Not today. Any other yeah, day, but not no. today. <laughs> <laughs> um, or maybe it's just in the way. Like, no, I, this isn't what I want. Where's the, where's the thing I want? I'm rummaging through my drawer. Mm -hmm. um, that's not yet present at hand, mm. but it can be the beginning of a more theoretical um, inspection of things. Like, maybe you you can't quickly solve a problem like that, and you have to really think uh, methodically and objectively about um, how things are put together, how they're built, and their dimensions, you know, what's wrong with them. And this can become the beginning of a, a theoretical approach to the world where you kind of set aside all those practical concerns and you just sort of, you ask, okay, well, what is this thing uh, in itself? What are its objective qualities, quantities, and so on? Um, which is where a lot of natural science and a lot of theoretical philosophy begins. Mm -hmm. But according to Heidegger, the, it began too fast because really you should begin with the everyday experience of the practical mm -hmm. environment. Mm -hmm. Well, there's also this distinction here of, so I can't remember where it is in being in time, but he makes this really, I mean, for me, it was a profound point, but things don't, actual things, right? Things that exist in the world many times don't come into um activation i guess you can say this is not the right word but until one's dasein literally activates it or or bumps into it so the pen is sitting on the table it's never going to do anything unless i pick it up and then i write with it right so there's this relationship that's going on between how one is using their design, their experience of the world, they're existing with other things that may be present or ready to hand. And that there is this idea of, again, it's just this very active kind of uh, way of looking at the world of that's going to be different. You know, the pen isn't sitting there thinking about what it's going to do. When's the next time someone's going to pick me up? When is it? These are a bunch of materials put together for the idea of use, right? There's this idea that there's going to be there and, you know, you could call it something else, right? We call it a pen, but you know, it's a, if you, you know, break it all down and, you know, we, we, we have the pen as the whole gestalt of it. Right. But the, the, all the bits and parts of it, you know, the ink and the springs and the tip and the cap and the, you know, whatever, 
all that together we call a pen. We label it a pen. You could label it, I guess, technically whatever you want. But it, it's this idea that there's this piece of, of us interacting with the world in a, in a very active way and that our, our Dasein is the thing that is activating many of these things. Again, not everything, right? I think this is in, in, in true for the environment and for instruments and how we're doing things. But that's that's very when you're looking at kind of what you're saying mapping it on this theoretical framework of the the world is very different if your what is your phenomenological experience of interacting in the world with certain objects and or within space because you could have a multiplicity of options that you could do or not do and it's your experience of living in the world that is determining implicitly or otherwise of what is going to happen so I, I, this idea of kind of one's design colliding or bumping into things that are present or ready to hand is a fascinating way of thinking of it i, I, don't, I don't what are, how are your thoughts on, on this well i i don't disagree with your description but i think it could go in a direction that heidegger would object to and i think he the language he uses for our interaction with useful things is interestingly designed to avoid that direction. So mm. instead of saying, um, I actively choose to pick up the pen and do something with it and make it useful, he says, I free the pen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I free it for its readiness to hand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's like it was lying there. It was already ready to hand, right? Yeah. It was ready to be used. But yeah. By reaching out for it, I, I enable it to be all that it can mm. be, mm, mm, um, mm. and I let it be. Mm. Uh, and and in his later philosophy, he he makes this a very important. Um, so this is like 1940s and later. He makes it a very important part of his thought to oppose um, a willful approach to the world, a voluntaristic approach to the world, and and fundamentally, there's a letting be. Mm. So that you can already see that in being in time. Mm. Um, and this is one reason he objected to Sartre's um, version of Heideggerianism in what Sartre called existentialism, where you've got um, this radically free subject, um, which is um, utterly freely and arbitrarily creating values and then uh, appropriating these in themselves meaningless objects and turning them into valuable things for us. Mm. Um, that he saw as utter nihilism. So instead, we're not fundamentally willful to begin with. We find ourselves just immersed already yes. in this mm -hmm. meaningful context, right? And and normally, we're, I'm not making a choice to pick up my pen, not a real decision. Yes. I just do it because it's there, and I may not even have noticed that I picked it up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I just know how to deal. Um, mm -hmm. What what Dreyfus says is I'm... I'm able to cope, mm, mm. Uh, maybe very skillfully, expertly, but th that's different from making an explicit decision. Mm. No, no, that's a that's a much better way of of explaining what I was attempting to say. Is is that yes, I, I this whole idea of uh, kind of a release or an uncovering or an opening, or um, I, I fully agree with, and I agree. I, I don't entirely believe we have you know, kind of this you know, true free will. I, I, I think that there's these ideas that to, all things have a kind of um, some sort of progenitor within us internally that we're unaware of. And so, you know, I don't, I don't know what the next sentence is going to be that I'm going to say, or I don't know, you know, really the next thing. And even when I make a decision, there was all these series of things in my brain that were happening before I came to, before I rose to consciousness and then I decided to do it. And so, I do like this idea of this kind of, you know, releasing the pen or, or, or the object or the, the hammer or whatever it is, you know, set, you know, allowing it to, to kind of, you know, open up, I think is, is, um, is a, is a fast, it's again, it's a, it's a fascinating way in which we don't think about it. I think consciously, at least I haven't, um, before reading his stuff of saying, wow, I didn't, that's a different way of looking at the world. Um, yeah. and that's a different way of operating in the world. Mm -hmm. I should make it clear that Heidegger does believe in in decision and choice and freedom, mm -hmm. um, but maybe not the way we tend to think about it in the modern world. And, and again, in his his late philosophy, he talks much more about letting be, being released, waiting, listening, um, being receptive rather than imposing. Mm 
mm-hmm. one's will. And and his you know his whipping boy on this, as for so many people, is Descartes. <laughs> he famously in um, part six of Discourse on Method says that we, through his way of uh, approaching the world, we have the capacity to become quote the masters and possessors of nature. Meaning, you know, nature is going to become our slave and our property, thanks to our objective calculations about how to exploit it. Uh, that's that's what Heidegger is often uh, concerned with and afraid of. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I, I share that. So, so you, you mentioned it, and I want to I want to take some time on it because it's it's not something I hear talked about often with Heidegger's thought is this idea of care. Uh, you mentioned it earlier. Um. So what what is I guess his notion of of care and it is within the idea of uh, of Dasein how we um, you know, he claims Dasein's being reveals itself is is a type of care you know so this isn't just oh do I care for somebody or care for myself so simply although there might be some aspects of that but what is the meaning behind the, his whole concept and notion of care and then you can talk about the three aspects the existentiality yeah. and the fallenness and all that. Sure. This is one of the concepts he develops um, very carefully and systematically in Being in Time. Um, so, so Being in Time, as we said, is, is a, his most systematic book. Yeah. Um, but it has a sort of spiral structure. So he, he goes around and around, giving a more detailed, uh, more thorough and deeper description of Dasein with each round. So this comes after a few rounds. And he has prepared for it by talking about how we care about the useful ready to hand things in our environment uh how we care for people um how we care about ourselves and then he says well let's just use the word care zorge to describe dasein's fundamental way of being Mm. uh and then he says there are three aspects to it and here he's in he's anticipating a further uh round around the spiral which is going to be a temporal interpretation Mm -hmm. Of Dasein, because the three the three aspects pretty clearly correspond to future, uh, past, and present. Mm. Mm. So the the uh, so I'll just use those words. Sure. The futural aspect of care is that we're ahead of ourselves, projecting possibilities for ourselves. Mm. Um, this means not necessarily that we're always planning or explicitly envisioning what's going to happen. But that um, whether we mean to or not, we're adopting certain possible ways to exist. Mm. And it's in terms of those possibilities for ourselves and for everything around us that we, we get ahead in the world and we make sense of the world. We understand things. So, so we're, we're projecting in mm. his terms. Mm. Uh, the past aspect of it is, that, is the always already. Uh, we're, we're always already thrown into a particular situation um we don't come out of nowhere which sometimes is what it seems like in in sartre Uh, i won't get into into sartre more right now but but for heidegger we're very profoundly thrown as he puts it we're indebted to a context which is a historical context a social context and just um you know when i wake up in the morning i wake up as finding myself thrown into a uh, familiar situation where I have to uh, I have to b- make myself on the basis of what I have already been. So I have a past. Yeah, let me let me pause right here on this point because I I, I see some pushback on this from right Sartre, who I'm uh, I appreciate a lot of Sartre, although I'm not the biggest fan. Uh, <laughs> um, De Beauvoir, I think Hannah Arndt, I think will push back on this. Why is there a resistance to his notion or concept of thrownness? Why why are people so like no like that's not that's not quite right or you know that's a wrong way of looking at it? I mean, when you spell it out that way, and when I've read his his ideas on thrownness, that is so obvious. This just makes obvious sense that we're obviously yeah. thrown into the world. I, mean, like, I think it's obvious, but um, let's see what are some possible objections. So I think. When Being in Time first came out, um, there was a kind of theological revulsion against it because it sounded like, you know, we're thrown into sin and we can never get out, or we're radically this worldly, or something like that. Um, 
Sartre and de Beauvoir talk about situatedness very much. You know, of course, you're always making choices in a concrete situation. Mm -hmm. But since they stress freedom so much, radical freedom, I think for them, the Heideggerian mm -hmm. approach is maybe too, uh, stresses our indebtedness too much. Mm -hmm. Um, Arendt, I'm not sure, really disagreed with him, but but she emphasized what she called natality, yeah. uh, which I think is maybe maybe would be clearer, more clearly described as fecundity. So our ability to give birth to new um, trains of action and events that are completely unpredictable, based on who we have been. Again, not something that's really deeply incompatible, I think, with Heidegger, but it's not where his emphasis lies. Mm. Um, and then another really interesting objection to throneness comes from Husserl. Mm. So Husserl, who was Heidegger's mentor and being in time is, is dedicated to him, um, he thought that Heidegger was going to follow him in phenomenology as, as Husserl understood it, which was an attempt to lay a firm foundation for all science and even all culture, um, get clear on necessary uh, essential structures of meaning. Now, if you take throneness radically enough, you can't do that because you can never stop being thrown. And so you're always going to be coming from somewhere. You're always going to be coming from some historical context. Um, you, you don't get out of that. Um, you can maybe work with it in a very creative way. You can transform it. You can learn from it. But you don't stop being a German in 1927 and become a pure mind, uh, which for you know, it may seem easy for us to accept, um, but for more mathematically minded people like Husserl, it's it's very troubling. And so, when he read uh, "Being in Time," he was actually quite upset. Well, again, but I think it's I hear some of these objections, but it, it I mean, again, aside from the obviousness of it, it is one of those things that it feels obviously compatible with how he's trying to understand being. And how, and, and, and again, this concept of care of saying, look, if you're thrown into a situation every day, whatever it may be, um, you have to have some ability to say, what am I going to do with this? How do I, how do for my own, um, what does he say? You know, many times people will hide out in the average everydayness of things and how, how we need to be more authentic and how we take care of the possessive Dasein we own and all these things. I mean, that's a very powerful, uh, you know, way of thinking about, you know, being itself about one's life, about their, you know, self-worth, if you want to put some, some kind of value on it. And I just don't, it makes sense in his whole kind of framework, but you know, obviously people are going to have their critics, but it, it, it's just, it, it's always strange to me when people kind of well, uh, resist it. it I, even though I'm sympathetic to Heidegger, I do understand the worries about relativism and mm. kind of um, giving up on the mm. very ideal of, mm. of certainty and clarity and foundation, which, you know, that ideal is so strong for, for Descartes, among many others, for Husserl, and um, for many people today still. So I understand those concerns. And then also, you know, retrospectively, once we know that Heidegger joined the National Socialist Party, sure, yeah. there is a connection there. Um, yeah. I, I'm, we may talk about this more, but once you start emphasizing thrownness, mm. then there's a, maybe a slippery slope into emphasizing, you know, ethnic heritage or mm. nationalism and denying any sort of universal, abstract, timeless political philosophy or mm in some belief in in human rights yeah that's right um, and so you can make the argument that for instance uh, the chinese government makes now and what do you mean human rights that's a western mm -hmm. imposition that's not part of chinese tradition that's not part of our mm -hmm. throne right mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah no there no that's totally fair i mean there is there is some um i think when you load certain things or if you load some bad faith actors onto this yes there's some very 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 uh, dangerous ways that could go um, obviously with, with Heidegger, there's always this kind of squinting to see in between, is he really saying that maybe not, is this mm -hmm. just, you know, it's hard to, hard to kind of know. 
Um, I guess, so one more thing on care and then the kind of anxiety that comes out of it. So the, there's, how is care, I guess, connected to this kind of hermeneutics of, of facticity? I mean, obviously, Gadamer has criticized him on this piece of it. Heidegger mentions that care lies before an attitude or situation of Dasein and does so a priori. How do, what are some of these other uh, kinds of aspects of, of care that he's talking about um, in, in his philosophy? So, so we said that there are three parts to care, and I talk about I talked about the future projection, mm -hmm. the past thrownness, but we didn't talk about the present yet. Mm -hmm. So, um, the the present part of it is is I think the Macquarie and Robinson translation says that we are alongside other mm -hmm. entities within the world, which always sounds so horribly static to me. Yes. Uh, yes. The word is is by b e i, which is what you use when you say you're you're um you're staying in somebody's house or mm. it's like the french chez mm. so um i like to say we're at home amidst mm. other entities mm. Mm. and so that's so that's the idea again of being in the world as a meaningful space mm. um and i and heidegger emphasize first the future then the past and then the present which means the present doesn't have priority anymore and that has radical uh implications for the meaning of being oh yeah um, because in the tradition we have tended to think that to be is to be present mm -hmm. and other forms of being need to be explained in terms of presence mm. um so uh among other things this relates to the question of hermeneutics or interpretation yeah uh if you are let's say sympathetic to descartes and husserl's way of thinking the goal that you're aiming at is is what husserl calls perfect evidence mm -hmm. right it's to total clarity where you have this kind of direct uh knowledge as you might have of the pythagorean theorem of how things are and why they have to be that way and or it's what descartes calls clear and distinct per perception of things mm -hmm. uh, in the broadest sense of perception so total presence but if all understanding, according to Heidegger, is getting ahead of itself and is projecting possibilities um, in terms of which things then get approached, then all understanding is interpretive. And it's all going to involve an, a hermeneutic circle. In other words, you project a certain way of approaching things, then you read things in those terms. Mm. But then that will in turn affect your projection. You'll need to reread and reread and reread and do a spiral, and you never get down to the bottom of things. So, so all there is is ongoing interpretation. Mm. Uh, and I think in that in that very general way, uh, Gadamer would agree. Oh. Yeah, it's it's a it's a very interesting way of trying to understand it, it's, it's a, it seems like a very kind of uh i'll say backwards but a different perspective of I mean, being this kind of mindful presence of things but to to we're you know even if you just think about how our human psychology works you know in terms of our brain and our intelligence we're um we have the we're always making decisions and we're always making these types of predictions in our mind and so this idea of future uh ways of understanding where we're going to be at is is something that we do in the present all the time and, and we're and we're but we're considering things from the where we've been and whether we do that consciously or unconsciously so it's a very interesting uh, framework which i would i would also agree with i guess on um this idea of, of anxiety so you know there's there's many things i mean I, I do think kierkegaard was um his concept of anxiety was was kind of prescient on this stuff and i think heidegger does it better but uh <laughs> um i'm not a big kierkegaard fan so for all my my listeners and some friends that i know like kierkegaard forgive me um kierkegaard's fine i i just don't like the jesus smuggling he does in all his philosophy but <laughs> But with Heidegger, he talks about anxiety as connected with being in the world in the face of, of anxiety and that there's a, a you know, in, in, in something or about something. And I guess what is these distinctions of how he looks at his anxiety? Because there is this idea of once you realize you're going to die, you understand that you will not exist anymore. Um, then you have all these ideas of saying, well, how do I live life or how do i do things now um and that there's a generalized existential anxiety on both accounts anxiety about living and then the anxiety of the eventual death um and so 
how do we understand his ideas about how we care for one's own Dasein within the understanding of this anxiety, this existential anxiety we have, um, et cetera. So what are his, his, his concepts here? Yeah. Um, so now we're getting into moments when everydayness and smooth mm. functioning and inauthenticity break down and, and reach a crisis, which, which I find very interesting. Um, as you say, it can be a crisis with regards to death or a related but, but distinct crisis just with regards to the present meaning of things in my world. Mm. Um, so maybe we'll postpone the, the death discussion, but, but uh, anxiety or angst uh, as, as the meaning of things in my current world. Let me talk about that. So when we say anxiety, I think in everyday English, we usually mean what he calls fear, which is worries about particular threats. Yeah. And if you're anxious, you sort of get, uh, it's like there's this swarm of, of worries that, that bedevil you. Um, but his angst can happen even if there's really nothing threatening concretely in your world. And maybe you're very successful and comfortable and you're just uh, sitting by the fire and relaxing. Everything can sometimes come to seem pointless or meaningless or empty. Um, there's a profound experience of, of vanity to quote Ecclesiastes, you know, everything is, mm -hmm. is empty. It's nothing. Um, vanity of vanities, mm -hmm. all is vanity. Mm -hmm. And that's no, no matter how successful you are and no matter what your theoretical, um, underpinnings may be, or how firmly you may think you're committed to some sort of interpretation of the meaning of the world. Mm -hmm. It's always fragile. Yes. Um, so we're, so we do always care and we'll, we're always plunged into a meaningful context. But the meaning is fragile, it's vulnerable, it can tremble, it can be shaken. Uh, and then, um, you know, as he puts it, and I think Kierkegaard makes the same play on words, uh, it's not about anything particular in the world, it's about nothing. And, you know, that's why people ask you, well, what's wrong? And, and you kind of snap out of it and you say, ah, it was nothing. Mm -hmm. Right, it was nothing. It was the nothing, uh, and that's that's what you need to stay with and and, and uh, dwell with in order to really understand your being profoundly. Yeah, this this kind of maps onto how we understand it clinically as well, right? Mm -hmm. So fear is usually a fear about a potential threat that could happen. Uh, anxiety is usually uh, a worry we have that isn't necessarily rooted in some future threat. It, it's a kind of this, you know, perseverative kind of uh, feelings we have about something that isn't necessarily uh, a potential threat. So, for example, if... Um, you know, if someone opens the door right now and points a gun at me, I'm going to feel afraid that I'm going to die because of, there's a threat right in front of me. Right. You know, and obviously this is a very exaggerated example. That's different from me worrying about, uh, is someone going to break into my house and that's never happened before. Yeah, there's a possibility for it, but I have no reason to suspect. So, you know, et cetera, or, you know, it could even be more innocuous than that. You know, I have some fear that something awful is going to happen to me, but there's no reason why it's not a fear of a particular event or specific thing. Anxiety usually has a very, um, amorphous kind of quality to it. Again, not always, but sometimes. And so I, it, I think if, if I may interrupt, I think Heidegger would still call those fears. He would still and call so, it fears. Interesting. So the mm. fear may be baseless, or it may be delusional, ah. mm. and it may be very vague. But if it's still, um, it's if it's some, about something that is that I believe is approaching, that I perceive is approaching as something that's going to harm me, mm. that's fear. But anxiety, in his sense, is you know, even if you remain totally unharmed, mm -hmm. your life can be meaningless. Yeah, and the same, and, and also in the same way as well. I mean, people many times that have clinical anxiety will say, "There's nothing going on. Yeah. Like, I don't feel anything wrong with me. Like, there's literally nothing, and I feel this tension. I feel this worry. I feel this, you know, kind of uh, apprehension. Mm -hmm. But I have nothing to connect it to whatsoever. Right? It might. This is kind of this state or this kind of feeling of sorts. So it does sound like it does map on to okay. to, yeah. to, to to what Heidegger is saying as well. So why? Why was he worried about this or why was he, or why was he thinking about this way of anxiety and, and how it's attached to his ideas of, of one's being? Well, he actually brings it up just before, um, looking at care. So, mm -hmm. so anxiety is disclosive. Mm 
it discloses uh, the structure of care if you look at it in a certain way like um i find myself thrown but i don't know why and that that is disturbing the, the sort of enigma of why do i have to be me mm -hmm. um i'm projecting possibilities but they seem empty they seem vacuous you know um vain and I'm in this world, but it it doesn't speak to me. It doesn't feel mine. Uh, so philosophically, you can then just take this as an opportunity to to think about the, that structure of care that's there, even when you're not feeling anxiety. Mm. Um, but anxiety is is deeper than that. Uh, in in the lecture, what is metaphysics? He says that in the clear night of anxiety, um, the being of all beings shines brightly. The fact that they are something instead of nothing. So that 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 feeling of of wonder that can come when you are open to anxiety, and you don't just try to deny it and evade it, um, it can be a wonderful thing. That yes, here I am, and I don't know why, and I don't know what it all means, and isn't that yeah. great? Yeah, there there is an openness to that, right? Mm -hmm. so there's there's a one perspective of saying like, oh my gosh, like what what's the answers or how do I live life? But then there's the complete other perspective of like, holy shit, there's so much freedom in that. There's so much. There's this, there's this wide expanse, and and that can be that can be a good kind of you know. Uh, you know, all respect, but I really do think it can be a shift in perspectives for, for, for humans. Um, and it's, it's again, when I've worked with folks clinically and, and done some of this kind of work it, to see someone make that shift is pretty, pretty spectacular. It's, it's a very cool thing to see. It's like, Whoa, like, and, and, and then you kind of have like front row seats to it. And, or, you know, other people I know personally have made that shift. It's, you know, again, that doesn't mean that you're not going to be scared or anxious about things in life, but just your general outlook or perspective when you understand that. And, and further, this might be a little bit too far uh, from what he's trying to say, but, you know, this is my, my secular humanist coming out, right? That's what you know, and that's what you need. I don't know if there's anything else that's required um in terms of a deity and the whole system now people could find some utility from some of those things sense of community that's you know those are some of the finer sides of uh some pretty anti-human uh, uh religious systems but there is something there of uh, yes you can be thrown into certain situations you can have certain everyday kinds of things you can have some type of angst but there's also this so much potential and this is kind of goes to the um, he talks about an introduction of, of being in time, which is kind of coming out of the Husserl tradition or whatever is this to the things themselves, right? How do we have this uncovering of the things are there, this phenomenological experience where every single you know day when you're doing something is a discovery of something about yourself, about the world and about others. When you look at things that way, that's a totally different way or could be a totally different way of living. Than living for something or someone, you know, whether it is, you know, a toxic relationship or, or you know, uh, enslavement to a, a job or career and or some kind of religious deity. I, I think that there's a lot of uh, true um, ways in which you can find some of, you know, you know, you know, a sense of morals or values or ethics. Um, an understanding of perspective of life that way. And so, again, that might be putting a little bit too much topspin on it in terms of a valence, but you could see some applicable ways in which this, this philosophy he has is, you know, can be very tremendous. Yes, that's, that's well put. I think it, it can be very liberating. Um, now, as somebody who is a fan of Kierkegaard, I should speak up and say that um, I can't call myself personally religious, but I do admire Kierkegaard. And I think he doesn't think of religion as belief, actually. So it's a more okay. of a, Say it's more. A what do you mean? Well, it's it's a leap of faith where faith doesn't mean a, an opinion or a belief or a dogma, but um, faith in a in a way of existing, which, as I understand it, involves uh, recognition that one does not know. Right? You know that you don't know, sure. but you still have to take up a, a stance in relationship to the unknown. Um, so, in that sense, faith requires doubt it requires uh, yes. awareness of your own ignorance mm -hmm. so i think that's a kind of mature interpretation of religion that that i mm -hmm. admire 
Mm-hmm. Um, of course, what we see a lot, unfortunately, is a kind of fundamentalism that is trying to desperately cover over the abyss of anxiety. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. And and that's, those are always my issues. I, I'll read Kierkegaard. I, I talked to, um, uh, Amber Bowen. She, she, she studies Kierkegaard and she's, she's a friend and she's, she's great on this. And we had a, a, a very nice disagreement <laughs> that conversation we had. Um, but, uh, I, I'll read Kierkegaard and then I'll, I'll start reading all this, you know, kind of exposition on, you know, Abraham and things like that. And, and it's, it's fine. Like it, it doesn't, I don't see the need for it aside from an example, but the first thing I'm thinking of is yes, but you could read it this way, but a, I don't know if it was quite intended to be read that way. And second, most people don't read it this way. It is a very mature kind of way of looking at things. And, but in, in practicality, it just isn't. And, and I don't know if it entirely could be read only that way. I mean, I think if you ask yeah. most Jewish folks and most Christians, you know, Abraham was a real guy and like those things really happened and they have the Abrahamic covenant, Genesis 12 and 15 and so on and so forth. And like that, they're not, they're not reading, uh, uh, you know, what's the leap of faith here. I mean, you can get some of that obviously, but they're reading this as like, this is our history or our tradition or our culture, or, you know, this is in the line of David and then the line of Jesus, you know, there's, there's this whole, it's hard. You'd have to do a lot of, ignoring of that kind of thing and then it, then you start getting into the kind of hermeneutics of it which is like is that how it was intended probably not quite possibly, quite possibly not um, um, so that's the whole thing with with Kierkegaard it's like oh I'm cool with all of this but then we just get this whole other thing and I'm like why why are we doing this and then it just makes it I for me personally and maybe this is just kind of my uh, view or stance is it just poisons the well at that point for me, it's just like, ah, we were doing so good. And then we get all this stuff that is, is I have to like turn on and off all these other things and it becomes very difficult. But yes, I would agree with you though. I do like some of his ideas about this whole like fear and doubt. And, and I think his way of looking at it, um, I can totally see it. Um, I just think it's, it would be very difficult for many people reading those same texts to to kind of see it that way or to have some kind oh, yeah. of yeah, I mean, ownership. It's, it's a very idiosyncratic reading. And of course he doesn't, Kierkegaard doesn't claim that he's doing history of religions or that he's describing <clears throat> yeah. what right. most Christians reading is. Yeah. In fact, yeah. he you know, distinguishes between Christianity, which is a very individualistic thing for him and Christian dumb, yep. which yep. is the way most so-called Christians behave. Um, <laughs> That's correct. But, yeah. <laughs> but to get back to Heidegger, he was, um, he, he did see Kierkegaard as kind of a kindred spirit. Mm-hmm. He, he just gives him a footnote in being in time, but it's a very nice footnote. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's some other places where he discusses him at greater length. But basically he says that Kierkegaard is too caught in med- in traditional metaphysics and Hegel and, and Christian concepts yep. in order to be able to express himself clearly, but he was on the right track. Um, That's essentially my view. He says, <laughs> it, he says at one point that the Kierkegaardian conception of the moment, mm. um, if you really, uh, he says that, that the Kierkegaard's concept of the moment opens up a new epoch in philosophy. Mm. Mm. Um, mm. Yeah, so. that's, a, that's a very nice those are very nice words coming from him and and i that's essentially i mean maybe i just have i've read a lot of heidegger and Nietzsche or whatever but you know that's heidegger's position is, is exactly my position on kierkegaard really good stuff really he's a brilliant thinker um but uh it's all the other things that kind of kind of distract a little bit um okay so i just want to spend a few times this is when i was preparing for the conversation i had a a bunch of questions that didn't really fit anywhere so this might be a kind of popcorn round of sorts but i want to try and 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 get some of this in here so these might be seemingly a little random um but i think they're important questions um so i guess the one one question i have is um, and, and some of these I've, I've fielded it from, from other people that I was, I was asking around some questions they would want to know. Um, one question here is how do you think, 
psychology would be different. Now, again, I, I know that's that's not necessarily your world, but just in how you you see it, you know, like how you see psychology. There's there's many issues with psychology. There's many great things too. But how would psychology you think be different today if we were more inspired by Heidegger's Dasein and and many of the things we've discussed, and by our Cartesian dualism or a cognitive computationalism? Um, what what where do you think things could be? I mean, again, this is a kind of what if question, but you know, what do you, what do you, what do you anticipate of that? I mean, I think you are, you are the one who's better qualified. <laughs> no, no. Um, <laughs> just to make a few remarks. I think, I mean, you're familiar, I'm sure with the Zolikon seminars that Heidegger gave to um, his, his friend, Medard Boss and a, a group of psychiatrists oh, yeah. in Switzerland. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a good, a good book for people who are interested in that. Yep. And just in general, my feeling is that psychology might be less reductive. It might be less mm. trying to explain the complex in terms of simple forces and trying to do justice more to the holistic complexity of, of human experience, um, mm -hmm. and the, human, the distinctively human way of being. Um, but how do you see it? Yeah, so I mean, I, I'm definitely a fan of Boss and Ben Zwanger. I thought they were uh, fantastic um, in trying to have some kind of clinical application there, if you will, kind of in the 40s and 50s, I think it was. Um, you know, there is a whole branch in terms of therapy, you know, so we have existential therapy, which, you know, I use some aspects of, um, where, you know, they were, they were looking at this and they were trying to say, like, again, much like the things we were talking about, like, well, like, we're talking about, um, you know, some ideas of perspective and existential anxiety and we're talking about thrownness and we're talking about being and we're talking about how do we create certain ideas of things like those all have implications for our psychology um wasn't it heidegger that said that uh psychology was just applied philosophy i don't know if that's his quote or not but um all, you know, sciences, the, all sciences are applied philosophy right yeah i mean that's yeah right that's the quote so you know it's like well why don't we why don't we map this on to some more, you know, types of clinical work? So existential therapy does definitely some of that. I mean, when I've taught the class to doctorate students, they, you know, they kind of moan and groan about doing, I, I teach them, you know, many of the major concepts of Heidegger's philosophy. And they're like, why do we need to learn all this? And then they're just like, you know, after the first half of the class, they're totally like set because it's like, once they get all the other things, it's like, oh, this makes sense if you're doing, um, you know, Rollo May or even Carl Rogers, or you're doing any of the, you know, you know um, uh, Irvin Yalom or some of the more <clears throat> existential kinds of theorists. So I do think in, in a therapeutic sense, there is some of that, but I, I agree with what you're saying, this kind of reductionist approach. I think in the field of psychology, you know, again, having these kinds of binaries or kind of putting everything into discrete categories as opposed to continuous kind of categories. I do think that there is some space where we would have a more uh, open and robust view of the human psyche as opposed to these, again, I agree with this kind of reductionistic kinds of ways of doing things. Um, but, you know, I, I, I do think um, the allure of kind of scientism is always there. It, it certainly captured analytic philosophy. Um, so, you know, in some ways and, 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 and still today, and, and look, there's a, there's a great, I mean, I'm a big believer in the scientific method. I'm sure you are as well, but you know, the scientific method always starts with hypotheses and those always come from some framework and those always come from some phenomenology. And so I think having more of a respect for some of those things and incorporating that more could be, uh, beneficial. Um, I guess the one other thing here is a two, two questions here. They're not sort of related, but I'm going to combine them. Um, what about language? You know, so Heidegger has these ideas of first perceptions, you know, things that are encompassed in language. Um, how does he describe how this works? And then any ideas about his ethics? You know, he didn't really write an ethical system like other people did. Um, mm -hmm. but the thoughts on that as well. Yeah, well, so language comes into being in time um, when he says that a basic uh, characteristic of Dasein, among many others, is uh, Rede, or translated as discourse, uh, which is not yet language in the sense of a set of articulated utterances, but um, it's the way the significance of things tends to sort itself out sort of along certain paths. It gets articulated in the as in 
a skeleton is articulated into joints and, and mm. bones, right? It gets um, differentiated. And so there are paths of meaning, as it were, along which we travel on a, on a daily basis. And uh, to these significations, words accrue, he says. Mm -hmm. So if something is an important element of our lived world, then we're going to want to talk about it. And we're going to find ways to signify it. Mm -hmm. uh, so we are always already linguistic in that sense. Mm -hmm. Now. We, one of the frustrating things about Heidegger is he never talks about uh, individual human development, um, doesn't talk about infants acquiring language. And, but um, basically his view is, you know, once you're Dasein, you're really Dasein, then you, you have language. Hmm. Um, so in that sense, you, it's probably true. You, it's always doubtful as to whether you can really remember anything before you were able to speak and hmm. articulate. Yeah. Um, and then he himself is a very careful, um, very respectful speaker of German and writer of German. Yeah, um, right, right. It tends to language and what it shows us and what it hides us. And he, he becomes increasingly interested in etymology, uh, what are the roots of words. And I, I would, he's sometimes criticized for that, um, but I, I enjoy it. I don't think he ever says, you know, slavishly, the root must be the real meaning. Yeah. But it's always interesting to look at where our concepts began in experience. Mm -hmm. and often, mm -hmm. um, looking at the roots tells you that. And, and I guess connected um, with that is, is um, this is another question I had, but just since we're here on this, you know, obviously Derrida was, was a, 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 a student of Heidegger, or excuse me, like, you know, um, from a distance, I, you know, he, he studied mm -hmm. Heidegger, he wrote on him all these things. Um, I've I just read the um, what was it the, uh, he wrote there was a lecture series the question of being or the history of being whatever there was a lecture piece that was yes. put out um, yeah. I'm, I'm butchering the title at the moment the question of history and, and being or something yeah like that. something like that that Derrida wrote which was interesting I mean I, Derrida is an inch I mean he's obviously a brilliant scholar in, in many ways I mean he was very smart his actual philosophy i'm less uh, attracted to for various reasons but um when he's studying the classics and he's studying other other folks i mean he's he's he is a scholar um, there's always something you get from him when he's when he's doing that stuff but he obviously he <laughs> he spent most of his life thinking about language right <laughs> that was his whole thing and so is there a way in which it seems that heidegger like kind of kind of starts out doing these things, right? So kind of what you were just saying about, you know, about language and then other people come after him and they just run with it in their direction, right? You know, how much do we see of this kind of, you know, is that not that it's a wrong way to do things, but is it not necessarily an accurate way of how, or is it, or did he just leave things too open-ended or he didn't have any enough kind of, you know, he, he stuck his flag on this thing. So the language thing pops up to my mind and, you know, how Derrida interprets, you know, uh, Heidegger and then uh, he spills it out with his ideas of language. What, what do we make about how people after him took some of his stuff? Well, I think he's appropriately open-ended. You know, he's, he's thought-provoking. As we said, a lot of it is just it's questions. And yeah. so that's very stimulating. And, uh, yeah, you really can't understand the course of philosophy since the 1920s without Heidegger. So we've talked yeah. about his relationship to phenomenology, existentialism, hermeneutics, and now postmodernism and deconstruction. Yeah. Um, and, you know, he's still the part of the conversation, very much so, even though a lot of that conversation is people deviating you know willfully or unwittingly mm -hmm. from what he said or people attacking him but that's still a way of being relevant um mm -hmm. so um, so greg fried and i have this uh book series that we edit called new heidegger research where we highlight that kind of thing mm -hmm. it includes various things like translations and 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 various studies anthologies but but we're especially interested in what people are doing now mm -hmm. that takes off from heidegger and is not just um uh, super respectful interpretation of the texts, which is, of course, important, yes. uh, but is more creative uh, appropriations of Heidegger. So, mm -hmm. so I, I'm all in favor of it. I, I don't think Heidegger himself would ever have said that philosophy ends with me. Yeah, I think it ends with me. He sort of dropped the word philosophy after a while. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, this is one of the things I really enjoy, just in general, about Gadamer because he he's, he just speaks to my my hermeneutical 
sensibilities. I really appreciate his his whole way in which he did things. Kind of a last last of his kind, <laughs> um, and so I really appreciate it. And I know he um, has some fair disagreements with Heidegger, but also really, really, I think. In my view, this is just maybe for me, but, you know, got Heidegger uh, right many times in, in how he was trying to really understand many of the, the aspects and from a hermeneutical approach. And so it is interesting to see how people do all these uh, offshoots. Yeah, I have, I have a few more thoughts on language if you're yeah, yeah, please, interested please, in. So, please. so one thing that I have written about is that um, in Being in Time, he says that uh, the, so the fundamental fact is discourse the sort of articulation into significances and then language is one manifestation of that but silence can also be mm. a manifestation of discourse right like there can be a pregnant pause or there can be the refusal to say anything mm. uh, and that can also be very meaningful and i'm sure that's important in therapy oh absolutely um, <laughs> yeah well again it's it's looking at the total experience mm. of language and one of those things is the um kind of the, the space right that's there right what what's in what's being said and what's not being said all of that is relevant for the phenomenological experience and many times what isn't being said uh, or what's being withheld or where there's a certain pause or things like that can be much louder than the actual content of words and again that's that's that whole kind of again gestalt way of looking at in experience or the whole way of looking at language which i think is is extremely important it's extremely mm -hmm. important because he's getting at nonverbal aspects of things as well so yeah now a few years later in the 30s he interestingly turns this around a bit and says that um silence is the origin of language mm. silence mm. is more primordial than language mm. so mm. um you could say, if you know, if we dare to speak about this, that the that certain fundamental experiences are um, are just incapable of being directly articulated. They can generate sayings, maybe poetic sayings, but those sayings can never exhaust that um, almost mystical experience. Yeah, that's that's. I never thought of it that way. That's a that's a very profound way of thinking about it. Yes, I hadn't <laughs> I hadn't thought of it. I have to think about that. No. Um, but but yes, there's there's something that really resonates with me because I think about you know humans in our evolutionary history that before pre language they certainly were communicating, and then you can look at other animals that don't have language like we do but they communicate you know so i definitely think there is something powerful and then i i always go to um art i mean obviously him and nietzsche believe that you know much of truth is in art in, in many ways and so i think you know if you're looking at <clears throat> uh, film or music or other you know works of art um you know fine art um paintings and such there is no word sometimes, or a lot of times there's no words. And there's something way more powerful, way more expressive than w using certain uh, aspects of language. So I, I, I firmly agree with that. But yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a very a nice way of putting yeah. it. I, I agree with that. When he writes yeah. about art, which he, he ignores in being time, but 1935, 36, he has this essay called The Origin of the Work of Art. Where it's a great, great essay. It's a great essay. It is a great, brilliant uh, and great enigmatic essay. essay, yeah, where he talks about the clash between world and earth. Yes, yeah. Earth is this silent, mysterious, you know, resistant, non-interpreted, maybe non-interpretable domain that, that we rely on, but we ordinarily um, cover over and and somehow art has a way of revealing this mystery yes yes Paradox, right it's, it's the revelation of non-revelation yes 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 i mean it was um it, it's a, I, I've, I think i've told this story before but um you know my my, my wife is uh, is in this world is in the world of art and in various mediums and uh you know she was trained in it formally and and I always appreciated it, but I didn't really get it, if you will. Um, and so uh, she would sometimes explain things to me and I'd be like, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Or that's cool or whatever. And I never really got it, even though I, I tried, but I never really got it. It just felt so different for me. And I kind of had a two bit version of it in my brain. And then I read that essay 
And then I, I, I was like, Oh my God, did you know? And this and this. And I was explaining all of these things. And she just kind of like, very, you know, uh, uh smiled and politely like, yeah, I was telling you that like 10 years ago. <laughs> I was just like, yes, yes, I just needed it to be said in a very complicated, <laughs> you know, uh, philosophical way. And then like, you know, and then like after that, like my mind opened and then I just, I couldn't unsee it anymore. And it's just like, yeah, and, and, and really respecting the, 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 the absolute essential um, necessity uh, and power of, of, of art, you know, true art, um, which I will make a distinction now from just content, which is a lot of the things that we get nowadays, you know, not content, uh, actual art. And so you can have debates about what art is and is not, and that's a different discussion, but, um, you know, art in a kind of just a general sense, I think is, is, uh, is very powerful. So I, I fully am on board with him and, and Nietzsche said many of the same things. And I'm sure you've read his lectures that he gave on Nietzsche. There's the four volume, uh, there's two books, but it's four volumes, I guess, um, of his lectures on Nietzsche, which are, I mean, just an absolute treasure. And he spends a lot of time talking about uh, Nietzsche's ideas on art and his ideas on art. It's, it's, it's brilliant. Um, so, okay, let's, you know, I feel like you can't not talk about it. I've talked about it in different ways and I, I kind of know what, sort of my feelings on it, but I'm curious to see what your ideas are here. So, um, you know, Heidegger was a Nazi or is part of the Nazi party. And this is a, a big stain on him, uh, definitely character logically or personally. And I think most, if, even if you take the most charitable view, I've talked about this with my friend, uh, David Hawinski. Um, I brought it up with other folks. Um, even if you take the most charitable view, okay. You know, of the time in the early days, early beginnings, you could kind of make sense of it, you know, joining the socialist party, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I guess it's after seeing everything that happened afterwards, the whole thing and the war ends in 45 or whatever. And, you know, again, he, he lives, uh, 30 years after the end of world war two and doesn't give any, I regret this, or I have a lot of remorse or a little bit of shame of doing this, even after they did all these horrible things. That's the part I think that really bothers people the most is not, I think some people could kind of say, look, if we, if we take, um, the timing of things and in time in history. And, you know, it's, you always pick in, you know, a certain side. If you understand a little bit of German history and where they were after world war one, blah, blah, blah. You could maybe say, okay, I could get it. You did before all the horrible things, this maybe have seemed okay. Um, but it's, it's the, it's the not <laughs> saying, look, I messed up guys. I shouldn't have done this, you know, whatever. I, I don't know how, what is, I'm sure you've talked about it a bunch of times and things like that. I mean, what is your kind of, uh, ideas or opinions on his involvement with the Nazi party and being involved there? And the, I know he lost directorship, but still, I mean, what is your just kind of ideas about, about his involvement with, with, um, the Nazis? Well, um, I guess we should say right away, Heidegger was a bad person. I mean, he, he just was. And uh, you know, a brilliant thinker and so stimulating and, and thought-provoking. And I think anybody who, you know, reads his texts with an open mind finds them interesting and deep. Yeah, but yeah he was a bad guy. He was a liar. He, he cheated on his wife repeatedly. Mm -hmm. um, he was very kind of evasive and also extremely proud and egotistical. Um, he kind of kind of an awful person. Um, I'm sure he had his nice moments with his good friends when he relaxed a bit, but kind of a nasty person and given like many people to anti-Semitic prejudice. Yeah. Um, and uh, when, when Hitler, uh, not only when he came to power, but we now know as early as 1930, if not earlier, he was reading Mein Kampf and, and praising it to his brother as a wonderful book. Um, so then, then Hitler comes to power in January 33 and, and Heidegger uh, gets excited and, and um, he joined the party and became the first Nazi rector of the University of Freiburg, yep. um, which was a position he held for one year and then mm -hmm. stepped down. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I would agree that he doesn't ever, until 1976 and his death, doesn't ever really satisfactorily um, admit his error. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and of course, 
we were just saying that silences can be very meaningful. Mm -hmm. Well, here's mm -hmm. a glaring example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But what does it mean? Um, now, that's that's what I would have. That's all I would have been able to say around 1990. But in the last 30 years, things have come out, and so there is more evidence now. Um, you know, not big public declarations, but he did say things. Mm. So there is there is a letter to his old friend. Carl Jaspers, who had kind of become his enemy and denounced him, that after the war, he writes a letter saying, you know, I'm sorry I've been so quiet, and and the simple reason is that I was ashamed. Mm. Which mm. I take as a slightly redemptive moment. Yeah. Um, then there are other things. He actually published a sentence which um, sounds, if you're very naive, you might take it as an apology. He says, he who thinks greatly must err greatly. Mm. Mm. so okay it was an error now yeah. of course as an apology it's the worst apology possible uh, yeah, it's, yeah. It's sort of no like, one's oh, happy with that apology <laughs> i mean it's, it's almost as bad as oh i'm sorry if your feelings got hurt that's right, right, right. right. exactly, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um and so it's praising himself and it's very abstract and it's mm -hmm. presenting it as the necessity of error and so it's terrible yes um but a lot of other things have come out so there, there are those books that um, that Greg and I translated. So Introduction to Metaphysics has, has been in print for since 1953. But, mm -hmm. but the 33, 34 books that I mentioned, Being in Truth and Nature, mm -hmm. History, State, those are more recently published. Those are in the 21st century. Mm -hmm. um, so those are from that year as rector. And um, mm -hmm. you can see him saying some things that are really alarming there. Um, so this is the period of his greatest enthusiasm, and these are things that now everybody has to consider when they when they think about this issue, as they must. Mm. Um, the worst is a passage where he talks about um, enmity, and he says sometimes the enemy may be internal to a people, and it may have, and it may be concealed, and it may be insidious, and then you have to hunt it down and and track down that enemy with the ultimate goal. Of total annihilation. Oh yikes! Oh big yikes! Yeah, I mean that's it's really blood chilling, and yeah, it is. And Heideggerians have tried to, you know, explain that away. You know, the enemy is inauthenticity or something. No, uh, in that context, at that time, uh, that's, that's, that's a that. big stretch. I mean, I, I will, I can give a charitable view, but my goodness, I mean, that's not defensible. <laughs> no, not at all. Yeah. And uh, then in Nature History State, which is the an attempt at political philosophy, he has some very alarming statements too, like um, uh, the goal of of, of uh, community must be total unanimity in accordance with the will of the great leader. I mean, it's, it's madness. Yeah. Um, now, he does step down and is, even the first lecture course he gives in 1934 after stepping down, which is on Holderlin, mm -hmm. his first lecture on, on the poetry of Holderlin, you can already see that it's it's less stupid and he is, he is gaining some distance he's calling things into question he's saying you know the fatherland is always a question it's a problem mm. and it's not a question that can ever be answered mm. it remains open you know who are we mm. um so he's he's concerned with the question of national destiny um but it, he tries to keep it a question and he's hoping that national socialism is going to be this sort of cultural revolution that that gets germans to question things uh and then more recently this series of private journals called the black notebooks has been yeah. published and yeah. they date from the early 30s to all the way up to the around 1970 i believe mm -hmm. um and that's shed a lot more light on his attitude so so it is safe to say that and this is somewhat a relief a relief that in the second half of the 30s and 1940s, he becomes very critical of Nazi ideology. Mm -hmm. um, so he treats it just as a metaphysical system that expresses that Cartesian ideal of being masters and possessors of nature, mm -hmm. controlling everything, objectifying everything, dominating everything. This is when he turns against that voluntarism that he had celebrated for a while. Mm -hmm. Um, so he comes out with a very negative view of the Nazis, but and my argument in in time and trauma is that unfortunately that doesn't bring him politically any closer to liberalism or leftism or democracy. 
because he develops this very perverse way of thinking where you need this ultimate, most terrible instantiation of modernity in order to bring modernity to an end. Hmm. So it, this, he sees it as the Nazism is the ultimate expression of modern metaphysics. And it has to be sort of let it, you have to let it play itself out to its inevitable catastrophe. And only then in the ashes of the catastrophe, could there be a new beginning for the West. So it's this very apocalyptic, uh, bleak, (laughs) very bleak and very removed and cold Mm -hmm. view of things where he doesn't really care about the fate of individual human beings. Um, yeah. So it, He's become he's become very um, very distant and very disappointed at this point. And, and I think after the war, um, he felt that it, that nothing essentially had changed. That the triumph of liberal democracy was just the continuation of modern voluntarism and modern metaphysics and modern technology in a form that was less extreme, but for that very reason would just kind of perpetuate itself indefinitely. Mm-hmm. and lock us into this uh, impoverished relationship to the world. And so he wasn't willing to make a public apology or say, mm-hmm. I was morally wrong, because at this point he sees morality as just a superficial, mm-hmm. um, rule-bound way of approaching Dasein. Um So he and other kind of uh, independent conservatives, uh, such as Ernst Jünger, go into this kind of internal exile uh, attitude where they say nothing in public and mm-hmm. they just kind of lie low. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, it goes back to the question again, I've talked about this, uh, uh, I think at the most at length on, on this regard, and this is kind of his work with, again, my friend, David Hwinski, who, you know, I know he's, he's written on this and I think some of his dissertation was on this on the bio biographical aspects of philosophers. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you take Heidegger out for a second. I mean, there's the bio, uh, biographical aspect of, um, uh, uh, Wittgenstein. I mean, he's probably clinically depressed. I mean, you know, he's, you know, Benjamin was also had his issues. I mean, you know, Aristotle was, you know, a racist, right? Isn't that the whole thing now? Everyone is saying, oh, my goodness. You know, I wouldn't say he was a racist, but he, he said that sometimes slavery is natural. Yeah, yeah. Oh, but that's, like, that's, the peop- that's how people are, are painting it now. I mean, yeah. everybody has, the human condition is problematic in many ways, and people have crazy ideas, or they have certain disregards, or things that we see as, you know, taboo, or things aren't right, or not politically correct. You know, Heidegger isn't isn't uh, isn't excluded from that. I mean, of course, you know, you don't get any really worse than being a Nazi, but I mean, or part of the Nazi Party. But you know, my, you know, Hwinski's idea is is you know is, is that that question of how not I mean, it's of sorts. How do we separate um, uh, the art from the artist, if you will, right? The thinker from their philosophy. But you know, how much of them is in their thought? Um, you know, there's no answer to that. Right. (laughs) Right. And so I think this is what makes people, I can see it. I can understand. Uh, I I mean, I have, I, I, I'm able to separate that, that pretty well. I mean, man, it's just kind of my profession or, uh, personality, but I can say, okay, look, you know, uh, Woody Allen probably did some terrible things. You know, it's not fully, you know, um, uh, sorted out, I guess, but Annie Hall's a great film. You know, I mean, it's a great movie. He makes great films. I mean, you can say the same thing about Polanski and some of these, you know, terrible characters. Um, like you're saying, because you're a bad person doesn't mean you can't make good art. And so then it becomes this thing of, well, but should we engage with that? And should we give it as much of a you know, quote unquote platform, all these things? And, I don't know. I don't have an answer to that. But I, I think with Heidegger, it does make people uncomfortable of saying, well, how much of this like horrible uh, uh, ideology and this whole political party and all the things that, that happened uh, in, in World War II, you know, and this guy's, you know, writing philosophy, how much of that's in the philosophy, right? Um, 
you know, so I guess to that end, I mean, if I put a pointed question, I mean, how much do you think his personal ideas about, you know, uh, Jewish folks or, or other things, uh, you know, an Aryan state or, you know, the thousand year Reich or whatever is in his philosophy? And is it, are, are we really able to separate him as a person being a bad guy of, of sorts with some of the profound things that he's, he's written about? Yeah, well, that, I mean, that is certainly the right question to ask, and um, it's a good question. And anybody who reads this while just setting these questions aside isn't really rising to the challenge and, and is missing an opportunity to reflect, right? So, so in a way, it's a gift that Heidegger gives us by being such a bad guy. <laughs> it makes it more thought-provoking. It, it, it does. It does. It does. It does. It's good philosophy. I I certainly don't believe in cancel culture being applied to philosophy because then, you know, what are you going to read? Nothing. I mean, <laughs> who of these guys, I talk about this a lot with my friends and um, my, my friend, Bethany Henning, who's a, a John Dewey expert. She says, okay, that's the one guy I can think of who is an exception. John Dewey, he was, you know, by all accounts, a really decent, good guy. And he was politically, you know, in favor of liberal democracy and, mm -hmm. and um, progressive and so on. But um, <laughs> most people, um, they have feet of clay. Yeah. So um, now sometimes with certain kinds of philosophy, you can easily say it doesn't matter. Like for instance, um, Frege, who was an important logician and sort of the, the founder of analytic philosophy as we know it. Uh, eventually his diaries were published and he was a raving anti-Semite. He was just spewing the worst stuff about Jews. Well, it's very hard to make a connection to his theory of of um, meaning and reference, you know, yeah. or his way of analyzing logical propositions it mm -hmm. just has nothing to do with it. Heidegger, though, is a guy who very on very early on in his career, he writes a letter to his friend Carl, Carl Lewitt, who was Jewish, by the way, saying, um, you know, everything I do comes from my I am and my existential situation. Mm -hmm. So he never pretended to be um, sort of neutrally objective. And then he's somebody who, who stresses thrownness, as we said. So that means, you know, philosophy comes out of who you are, and it comes out of your historical situation. And, and so we have to look at how he conducted himself in his historical situation. Mm -hmm. So that's all to say that it's a very legitimate question. Um, and then you'll find a wide range of interpretations, and often people are at each other's throats about this, right? Some people say, uh, no, he could never have been a Nazi if he'd really understood himself. Mm. His philosophy is deeply anti-totalitarian and so on. Others will say, you know, everything in being in time is crypto-Nazism. And when he uses the word care, he really means um, ethnic cleansing or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I think that's far-fetched because most of being in time is so abstract. And it's but, 19. Uh, I mean, he was writing this in the early 20s. I mean, this is before a lot well, of that stuff yeah but the national socialist party was was on the rise and um you know radical right uh attitudes were you know they flourished in the weimar republic and then burst out during the nazi yeah, that's fair. So yeah. it was around um now where you can anticipate maybe his political views uh are in is and most people say in the section on authentic historicality in being in time. Mm. So we, we talked about care on the individual level, but uh, Dasein is always being with others. And so you can also talk about the projection and thrownness of a community. Mm. And there he uses the words destiny and heritage. Mm. And he says that every generation must, through communication and struggle, Kampf, uh, determine its destiny. Mm. Uh, and choose its hero. Mm. Now, I think that's still very abstract and very vague, and it's consistent with choosing, you know, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. as your hero rather than Adolf Hitler. But right. still, you can see a kind of, you know, very vague nationalism, uh, not racism, because it's all historical rather than biological, but, right. but nationalism. And you can see how he might be kind of primed for that kind of radical political leap in a time of crisis. Mm 
yeah, it's it's hard, right? Like if if he if he never was part of the Nazi party officially, you would read that and not even probably blink twice, right? Or if you never if you read that and you never knew anything about him personally, well, you probably wouldn't even blink twice. So it, it you know, but it is it is it is it, the the bottom line is is people are super complicated, and I do think many people I, obviously there is overlap on things but i do think many people are um uh, compartmentalized in some ways um and that makes for it, it's hard it's hard for people for most people i think you know to say well you know how could the person that murdered somebody also be a good dad it's like well maybe they are I don't know. I mean, it, this is about the human psychology and it's very complex. Um, not because I want it to be, or um, that's my spin on it. I mean, I think that just really, there's so many factors going on. Um, yeah, I and think so we, I, I think there, there's something there of like, someone could be good at something or a career or their talent or their skill and be a terrible, awful person, but it doesn't, you know, I, the example I use is, you know, he's like, you know, Mike Vick was a phenomenal quarterback. He was a great football player and pretty terrible for, for a long time. He was pretty terrible to, um, to, to animals. Uh, and you know, he did his time and he did all the things and he, I know he's tried to redeem himself. I, as far as I know, uh, in a, in a good way, as much as the best he can, but that has nothing to do. I don't think, or it doesn't, the majority of it has nothing to do with, you know, how he throws a football on a field. Right. But of course, philosophy is supposed to be about Humans. understanding, and especially understanding, self-understanding. Yeah. 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 Um, you know, but unfortunately we are all human and no matter how intelligent we are, we do, we are capable of lying to ourselves. Mm -hmm. We're mm -hmm. capable of uh, believing things just because we want to believe them and uh, deceiving ourselves and others and, and being oblivious and inconsiderate yeah yeah no I, I, we're not I, deliberately I, malicious and so i think <clears throat> heidegger had his moments of deliberate malice and he also had many more moments of self-deception and inauthentic evasion and yeah I, I i fully agree with you there uh one quick question here i just want to get it in here and then and then uh, uh and then one final one um is he wrote a, another great essay on the question concerning technology um, I don't know if you've written on this or, or lectured on it. I'm sure you have at some point, but um, many people try and people uh, not quite the same, but people sometimes will take certain things and apply it with current day stuff. And I don't know if that's always helpful to do. So, you know, people will take the origins of totalitarianism with the front page of the newspaper and see, look, here it is. You know, I feel like some people do this, not maybe in the same way, but they'll take Heidegger's ideas about technology and, and just start, you know, waxing philosophical about all the technologies we have currently. I guess from that essay and his further thoughts on technology, you know, what's the kind of, you know, uh, uh, two minute, you know, version of how he thought of where technology was progressing and, and what that means from his philosophical vantage point. And how can we have a, because we live in a digital age of sorts, you know, how do we best understand accurately his ideas, you know, currently with all of the technological advances we have? Yeah, well, so today we sometimes use technology narrowly to mean, you know, electronic digital technology. Mm -hmm. Then there's a broader sense, which means all human inventions. That's very broad. Mm -hmm. uh, or you can use it to mean modern industrial technology that draws on um, natural science. Heidegger doesn't mean it in any of those senses. He means it as a way of experiencing the world or a way of understanding what it means to be. Um, so I referred to the Cartesian idea of mastering and possessing nature. Mm -hmm. That's a helpful approach to it. Um, mm -hmm. Descartes is a technological thinker, very much so, not just because he's interested in inventing things, but because he sees things basically as what today we call resources, mm -hmm. right? Nature becomes natural resources. Mm -hmm. And that means we too become human resources. And, and then there's time resources, information resources. To be is to be a resource. Mm -hmm. So that is uh, the kind of disclosure of entities as a whole that Heidegger calls the technological way of revealing things. Hmm. Um, and his 
attitude to that in a nutshell is uh, that's a very impoverished, um, narrow way of approaching things, but it is our current historical destiny. And so the way beyond it can't be, oh, let's invent something new or let's decide to do something new because that in itself is a technological attitude. But instead, we have to see this way of revealing as a sort of gift, which mm. comes from a source that we don't understand that we, and that we can't control mm. technologically, which then opens up the possibility of a new way of dwelling in the world. Mm. Um, now, that's all very broad and abstract, but I do think his model for this interpretation of technology is um, industrial technology and the use of fossil fuels and factory production, you know, over, you know, since the early 19th century into the mid 20th century. Um, when it comes to technology in the narrowest sense, which is digital technology, mm -hmm. um, he did live long enough to be interested in that. Mm -hmm. So um, Norbert Wiener's book, uh, Cybernetics, came out in 1948 or 49. Mm -hmm. um, that's a very technical book, but uh, Wiener also came out and he was an American uh, theorist and mathematician who invented this term cybernetics. He wrote another more popular book, which Heidegger did read. Um, huh. And he then started referring to cybernetics um, occasionally in his writings. And so I, I've written a, a piece that extrapolates from this and talks about a Heideggerian huh. interpretation of cyber being, as I call it. Huh. Um, there, there are all sorts of new interesting things that happen when digital technology um, becomes so, so important and when information rather than mass-produced objects uh, is the commodity in which we're trading and so heidegger of course didn't anticipate all of that but but there are heideggerian inspired approaches that mm. that could be useful yeah yeah and that's just very fascinating and you know this is not a lot of people have written on it so then when we that's so much part of our world it's, it's, it's you know how do we understand those concepts of being and worldhood within that context of this kind of you know a different way of dwelling and it, it, it does become very interesting and, and, and tangible. So I guess the last question is, is uh, what's the legacy of, of Heidegger? I mean, we've been talking about it in different forms, but you, I think you mentioned earlier, people are, are, you know, looking at, you know, his impact on philosophy and then the world at large, you know, afterwards, I know there's still, um, it's like, uh, it's like, it's like people that, that, uh, when they, when they pass, when they die and then they have all these albums, they release, release posthum posthumously. Uh, <laughs> I know that there's English translations of Heidegger stuff coming out all the time. Um, some of them I have on pre-order <laughs> ready for them to drop. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, what's just kind of the legacy of, of Heidegger uh, what's the future of kind of studying him and his, his philosophy, uh, uh, just kind of in a general sense. Yeah, it's still coming out. He's been very prolific from beyond the grave. So the, the Gesamtausgabe or collected edition is, is almost done, but not yet. Um, and the translations continue as you say, but I think we can. I mean, I, I am very confident in saying at this point, Heidegger is a great philosopher. Yeah. That doesn't mean he was a good person. It doesn't mean that he's right about anything, even though I think he was probably right about a lot of things. Mm -hmm. uh, it just means that he's permanently thought provoking. So mm -hmm. with people like that, no matter how much, quote, progress in philosophy there may be, uh, every generation is given the opportunity to take up their books once again and mm -hmm. think through them and argue with them and and just be provoked to be more aware and raise more questions. Yeah, no, I, I, I firmly agree. Well, uh, Richard, I mean, this has been such a, a, a fabulous uh, conversation, very, very um, uh, fulfilling for me. Um, and I, I really just can't say enough thanks. I'm, I'm quite a certain that listeners will get a, a lot out of it. So I can't thank you enough for your, your, your mind and your time and your energy. Uh, it's it's been uh, fantastic. And uh, where can people find you? Um, well, they could send me an email, polt at xavier.edu, um, or they can Google me and they'll mm -hmm. find that, um, among other things, um, my other obsession beyond obsessions beyond Heidegger include typewriters. So that's my oh, very alternative cool. to, to cyber being is to use a lot of typewriters. <laughs> uh, that's great. So I'm, I'm easy to find. And uh, thank you for your great questions. It's really been a pleasure. No, no, thank you. Thank you.